When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, everybody. I'm Jared Halverson. Welcome back to Unshaken. We have some incredible stuff to cover this week in the Book of Mormon, including one of my favorite chapters of all time, Ether chapter 12. And to introduce it, I want to give you a bit of a test and something of a tour. And they both have to do with the concept behind a Hall of Fame. So here's the test. Which Hall of Fame would you find in Springfield, Massachusetts? If you're a basketball fan and you chose that, then you're right. What about Cooperstown, New York? That's where you'd find the Baseball Hall of Fame. Canton, Ohio, anyone? There's the Football Hall of Fame. Now, if you're not just interested in sports, there are other Halls of Fame as well. For eight years, I lived in Nashville, Tennessee. And sadly, I never took the opportunity to go visit the, you probably guessed it, Country Music Hall of Fame. If country's not your style, then head north to Cleveland, Ohio, and that's where you'd find the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Anyone know which Hall of Fame is found in Charlotte, North Carolina? The NASCAR Hall of Fame is there. Or how about Fort Worth, Texas? You'll find the Bull Riding Hall of Fame there. Seems appropriate. St. Louis, Missouri? Anyone? That's the World Chess Hall of Fame. And the next time you're visiting the Sacred Grove, swing over to Rochester, New York, and you'll find the Toy Hall of Fame. There seem to be Halls of Fame for practically everything out there. Now for the tour, imagine what you typically see when you walk through a Hall of Fame. There's little alcoves or a room dedicated to a certain time period, whatever it might be. And typically, there is some kind of display. The name, a bust of the famous athlete or entertainer, for example. Often there's some paraphernalia there. Someone's bat or cleats or ball, their guitar or their stage outfit, whatever it might be. And usually it's that paraphernalia and perhaps a plaque or some kind of an explanation of what it all represents that gives you a sense of what it was that brought that person into the Hall of Fame to begin with. What did they do to deserve this kind of honor? Well, Ether chapter 12 is the Hall of Fame for Faith, Book of Mormon edition. I say Book of Mormon edition because the Bible has its own Hall of Fame as well. And that's Hebrews chapter 11. Now, in that one, the book of Scripture they had was the Old Testament. So even though it's in the New Testament, it's the Old Testament edition of the Faith Hall of Fame. And the people that are in it are incredible. As you read through Hebrews 11, you do get a sense of walking down the hallways and seeing a bust of Abraham and Sarah and an explanation of what they did that showed their faith to the point of induction among this incredible crowd. You see the ark of bulrushes that baby Moses floated down the Nile in. You see a sling, maybe a replica, of what David used when he defeated Goliath. It's an incredible chapter to study. If you were just to sprint down the hallways of that chapter and have the quickest tour imaginable, you'd see displays for Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, the Israelites, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets. The list could go on. But if you took the time to study each display, and try to make sense of what it was that that person or those people did to receive induction into this Hall of Fame, you'd notice things like this. They sacrificed. They prepared. They obeyed. They received strength. They blessed others. They resisted temptations. They suffered afflictions. They forsook the world. They obtained the promised land. Near the exit of that Hall of Fame, there's a set of verses that just sums up the whole concept. They subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And then the writer of Hebrews inserts this phrase in parentheses. 
as if he was muttering something under his breath as he walked you to the exit of the Hall of Fame, of whom the world was not worthy. That's why they're in the Hall of Fame, and so many others are not. These people had such faith that it made the world unworthy of them, and yet they shared their faith with that unworthy world. I am so grateful for those who occupy the halls of this Faith Hall of Fame. And to study those who Moroni includes in the Book of Mormon's version of the Faith Hall of Fame, I hope we leave the exhibit whispering the same words under our breath, of whom the world was not worthy. Now the idea for this Faith Hall of Fame, which is Moroni's, Ether 12 is his chapter, emerges from a message that Ether includes right at the beginning. Remember, we met him last week in the very last verse of Ether chapter 11. We'll meet Ether more specifically in the second part of this lesson. But in chapter 12, verse 2, we discover that he is a prophet of the Lord. Now, we've seen a lot of those in the book of Ether. And every time they appear, they are crying repentance and warning the people of an impending destruction if they choose not to repent of their sins. Now, Ether's message, like his prophetic predecessors, is very similar. But there is one really important difference. Verse 3. He exhorted the people to believe in God unto repentance, lest they should be destroyed. You see that all-important addition? It wasn't simply, repent of your sins, lest you be destroyed. That's what we've seen over and over in this book already. But rather, believe in God unto repentance, so that you won't be destroyed. He emphasizes that focal point at the end of the verse, saying unto them that by faith all things are fulfilled. So you see Ether's shift in emphasis? Amulek does this beautifully in Alma 34. Four times in three verses, he uses the phrase, faith unto repentance. We understand that from the fourth article of faith, the doctrine of Christ, that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are, first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which then grows into, second, repentance, and then third and fourth, baptism in the Holy Ghost. But the need to repent grows out of our faith in Jesus Christ. The better we know him, the more we recognize how far we've fallen short of him, and the more we rely upon his grace to make up that gap. So rather than simply crying repentance, which is always important, Ether takes one step back and focuses primarily on faith. It's not just the behavioral repentance, it's the belief-based faith. And like President Packer has taught, true doctrine changes behavior. And since all these prior prophets have been teaching behavior, you have to repent of your sins. Perhaps here's Ether realizing, I need to take one step back and teach faith in Jesus Christ. If they have that, repentance will naturally follow. Ether's focus on faith is beautifully summarized in verse 4. This verse is such a masterpiece. Wherefore, whoso believeth in God, there's our faith, might with surety hope for a better world. And if there was anyone who would be hoping for a better world, it was Ether. And I could add, it was Moroni. Those two are parallel prophets, the final messenger of their civilization. We could even say their dispensation. Their own world was coming crashing down. But to place their hope in a better world because they were able to place their faith in Jesus Christ? Ether continues, Yea, even a place at the right hand of God, Elder Maxwell distinguished between what he called proximate hopes and ultimate hope. Proximate meaning near, things that we hope for in the day-to-day, -day, as compared to ultimate hope, the one far off. The Hall of Fame in Hebrew seems to suggest that idea, as these people were pilgrims and strangers upon the earth, but looking for a far country, some distant desire, a better world to come. Ultimately, a place at the right hand of God. And with that ultimate hope fixed firmly in place, proximate hopes can kind of come or go. We're more content to leave those with the will of God because the ultimate hope can be realized. Again, he repeats, which hope cometh of faith. That's where it comes from. It's faith to hope. The order there is important. We'll see the third link in a second. But that hope which comes of faith maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast. Can you sense Ether seeing his people being pulled away by the strong currents that the adversary is pushing in their direction? 
the Jaredite people were being swept downstream towards the waterfall where they would come crashing against the rocks below. What they needed more than anything was an anchor to keep them sure and steadfast. An anchor that would dig into the rock of their Redeemer and keep them from being pulled astray. You remember it was Mormon back in Mormon chapter 5 who talked about his people, again, parallel group to what Ether is seeing in his own, that they were led about by Satan as a vessel is tossed about upon the waves without sail or anchor or without anything wherewith to steer her. Paul warns about being tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Sound a little like the secret combinations we've been studying? Those like the daughter of Jared that were exceedingly expert and making things look exceedingly fair? That's the slight of men. That's cunning craftiness. And it ends up carrying us about with every wind of false doctrine that the adversary blows in our direction. We need an anchor to keep from being blown about by it. James says something similar. In the verse that follows, that all-important verse that spurred the restoration, After assuring us that we could ask of God any time that we lacked wisdom, James then adds, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. It's in the face of those waves and winds that make us waver, that we need an anchor to hold us firmly in place. And that anchor is faith. I mentioned last week that story from Acts 27 about the shipwreck that Paul experiences. And when that ship was first about to fall upon the rocks, the account says that they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Have you ever experienced that dark night of the soul where you just wish for dawn to come, for light to return, for a reassurance that all will be well? Well, in the meantime, what do you do? You cast anchors out of the stern, everyone that you can find, anything that will tie you to the rock of the Redeemer. It is our faith in Christ that founds our ultimate hope for a better world. It is our faith in Christ that ties us to him and makes us sure and steadfast. And it is that faith in him which leads to that hope, which then leads to the charity hinted at in the final phrase of verse 4 always abounding in good works. We're moved to serve. We're moved to lift. We're moved to love. All because of that hope in a better world that we feel motivated to help bring about. And what's that motivation come from? From faith. Faith in Christ. And best of all, with our faith in Him, instead of simply in ourselves or in the positive potential of humanity, there's no hypocrisy here. There's no self-service There's no ulterior motives. Notice the last phrase of verse 4. Being led to glorify God. He's the one that deserves the credit here. He's the one in whom we placed our faith. What an incredible message from the prophet Ether. And it gives us a taste of what he may have been hinting at in verse 5. It came to pass that Ether did prophesy great and marvelous things unto the people. Again, compare that to the prophecies that we've seen throughout Ether from the other prophets that have come before. Now, I'm sure they said other more positive things as well, but what's preserved in Scripture is always these dire warnings against destruction that is imminent. And nobody knew just how imminent that destruction was better than Ether. He was going to witness it all firsthand, but he seemed to approach things far more positively. Instead of just crying repentance, he cried faith unto repentance. And instead of just warning them of the destruction that they were headed to, he taught them great and marvelous things. He prophesied those things to the people. Hope for a better world. We can get there. We can solve these problems through the power of Jesus Christ. We just have to place our faith in him. Unfortunately for the people, and ultimately for Ether, One of the key elements of faith is that it isn't perfect knowledge. It isn't proof. It isn't empirical. That's one of the first things you see on a big plaque at the entrance of the Hall of Fame for Faith in the book of Hebrews. Now, faith is the substance. Joseph Smith translation corrects that to assurance. It's the assurance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Again, we'd scratch our heads. Wait. 
If it's not seen, then how can there be evidence? Well, that's exactly it. That's the paradox that lies at the heart of faith. There's evidence, but it's of the spiritual kind, not the empirical. So at the end of verse 5, even though Ether has come across as so beautifully positive, prophesying great and marvelous things, far beyond the repent or die Jeremiads of previous prophets, unfortunately, they did not believe. And the reason why? Because they saw them not. I need evidence that can be seen, not evidence of things that cannot be. I need proof, not mere assurances of the things that I'm hoping for. But that's not faith. It doesn't ask of us much. It doesn't draw upon deeper wellsprings of belief. It doesn't make demands on decisions that are against the odds. It doesn't require us to exercise agency to the same degree. It doesn't introduce us to our real selves. It doesn't introduce us to God. Faith does all of those things. That's why faith has to be at the beginning. Now, it's at this point that Moroni interrupts the narrative. He'll get back to it in chapter 13. But here he wants to stop right where Ether left off and lead us through a walk of the Book of Mormon's Faith Hall of Fame, as well as Moroni's explanation of why it's so important for us to exercise our faith to the point that we might join the ranks of those who are installed there. He says in verse 6, and now I, Moroni, would speak somewhat concerning these things. I want to talk about faith. Dad interrupted the narrative all the time with his brief, and thus we seize. Occasionally, much longer explanations of things he was seeing in the story. Well, I hope you'll excuse me for following my father's example and doing the same. And it will last for the rest of this chapter. He begins by confirming Ether's view of faith basically by reinstalling the same kind of plaque that lay outside the Hall of Fame in Hebrews. I would show unto the world that faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. Wherefore dispute not because ye see not, for ye receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. Can you sense Moroni just wanting to come to Ether's rescue? He's watching this unfold as he's abridging these plates and seeing that Ether's message is being rejected because people can't see it and touch it and taste it. They can't weigh it. They can't measure it. It's non-scientific. It's non-empirical. We're back to the story I told you earlier from Gulliver's Travels of those blind scientists trying to mix paint color by touch and by smell. It's just not going to work. And so this second witness, Moroni, joining Ether, you're not going to know that way. You've got to learn to know this way. It is a divine epistemology. And the world's way of coming to knowledge pales in comparison because it doesn't build character along the way. This way does. So don't fight it. Don't dispute it just because you can't see it now. You will see it then. But you'll finally know what to do with what you see because you develop the eye of faith along the way. Moroni's takeaway from this, the lesson he most wants us to learn, is what he said at the end of verse 6. You will not receive a witness until after the trial of your faith. That is such an important principle for us to understand. Now, I talk about faith crisis all the time because of my doctoral work in anti-religious rhetoric. I study these kinds of things all the time and how secularism is used to try to force faith into a corner. But I remember once getting a little bit of kind and gentle pushback from someone who had been to a fireside where I spoke about faith crisis. And he simply said, you know, I see the relevance of this topic. I'm grateful that more people seem to be talking about it and writing about it because this is what we're up against in these last days. However, the phrase, faith crisis or crisis of faith is non-scriptural. So why do we always label it that? The scriptural phrase is not crisis of faith, but rather trial of faith. And there's a different feeling, a different spirit to that. That it's not just, I'm in faith crisis. It's simply, ah, my faith is being tried. It's being tested. It's being proven. It's being stretched. It's being strengthened. If I'll allow that to be the result, that's the sense that Peter gives us when he says that the trial of your faith, not the crisis, the trial, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see what he's saying there? If gold, 
which is mere metal, is worth being tried in the fire, then how much more worth it is it to take your faith, far more precious than gold, and try it in the fire as well? That's what purifies it. That's what refines it. That's what burns away the dross. And that requires some heat. That requires some trying. I've talked about this elsewhere, that faith follows the trajectory of creation, fall, atonement. And it's that fall stage where faith is truly being tried. What we thought we saw in the first stage, back in the innocence of Eden, isn't quite so clear down here east of Eden. But as that faith is tried and purified and refined, we move forward, up the ascent towards the atonement, with the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We believe in a fortunate fall when we speak of Adam and Eve. We're the only church that does. Well, do we have the faith to see trials of faith in a similar light? That that quote-unquote fall might actually be a fortunate one because our faith is being tried in the fire, far more precious than gold. It is that tried purified, refined faith, far more than the untested kind we started with, that brings real praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. For when Christ returns, will he find faith upon the earth? And if he does, what kind of faith will he find? That's one of the most important contributions Moroni makes to this discussion. He keeps bringing up things that will prove that thesis statement, that we do not receive witnesses until after the trial of our faith, because tried and tested faith is the kind that the Lord wants to see in us. He makes that clear again later in this chapter in verse 17 and 18. He's speaking of a specific case in 17, but the principle applies across the board. Through every hall of the Hall of Fame, they obtained not the promise until after their faith. And again, this universalization of this principle, verse 18, neither at any time hath any wrought miracles until after their faith. Wherefore, they first believed in the Son of God. Why do you think faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the first principle of the gospel? It's the one from which everything else grows. No real miracle ever occurs until after faith in Jesus Christ. So believe first and then receive the promises. Look for those kinds of principles in every display that we see today in the Faith Hall of Fame. Think before and after with every exhibit. Before is always faith, and after is whatever came of it. So let's go back and start seeing that. Our tour is about to begin. Verse 7, first exhibit. For it was by faith, so now we have the before, and here's the after, that Christ showed himself unto our fathers after he had risen from the dead. He showed not himself unto them until after they had faith in him. Wherefore, it must needs be that some had faith in him, for he showed himself not unto the world. See what he's saying at the end there? Some saw him and some didn't. And while repentance definitely was one of the things that distinguished between the two groups, but what Moroni brings out is it wasn't just repentance and righteousness, it was faith and faithfulness. Some believed that Jesus would come and after the trial of that faith, those days of darkness and destruction, he did come. And they did see. In fact, that fulfillment of their faith in 3 Nephi 11 was the second such example in 3 Nephi. Remember the one in chapter 1? As they were waiting and hoping against hope for the sign of the birth of Jesus Christ, those who believed that Christ would come against the odds, faced fear with faith, and didn't deny even when their life was hanging in the balance. So whether in their case or in our own, believe first and then see the Savior. See him come into your life. See him bring you to life when death is what's staring you in the face. See the light and life of the world. Descend into your life to push out the darkness and destruction. But that coming of Christ to you must be preceded by your faith in him. That first display from verse 7 describes the coming of Christ. The second display in verse 8 describes his mission. 
because of the faith of men, he has shown himself unto the world. So not just his showing himself among the Nephites, he's showing himself unto the world. In what way? By glorifying the name of the Father and preparing a way that thereby others might be partakers of the heavenly gift, that they might hope for those things which they have not seen. This seems so much more broad than what he described back in verse 7. He comes into the world, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. To do what? To glorify the name of the Father. What does Jesus say about that in the New Testament? It is through his atonement, his sacrifice, his crucifixion, his resurrection, that he glorifies the name of the Father. It's through his atoning sacrifice that he prepares a way. He is that way whereby we could become partakers of the heavenly gift. This is atonement, and it came about because of our faith. The faith of men and women. The faith exercised in pre-mortality, in that war in heaven when the Father asked, Whom shall I send? And one holy hand was raised, who said, Here am I, send me. Against the odds, in the face of the accusation of the accuser of our brethren. That's what Lucifer is described as in the book of Revelation. Against those accusations that were leveraging the risk inherent in the Father's plan, we exercised our faith in that promise. Jesus will be able to do it. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah that has prevailed to open the book with the seven seals. That's the sense you get in Revelation chapter 5, where weeping turns into singing because we exercised faith that Jesus would be able to perform this work. He will prepare a way. He will glorify the name of the Father. He will make available to each of us the heavenly gift. Moroni summarized it so beautiful in verse 9, wherefore we may also have hope and be partakers of the gift if ye will but have faith. You see him echoing what Ether had said back in verse 4? That hope, ultimate hope, hope to be partakers of God's heavenly gift, that comes from faith. Faith to hope to charity. We will see the order explained incredibly well by Moroni's father, Mormon, once we get to Moroni chapter 7. That is another masterpiece. And it teaches this order of faith to hope to charity better than anything else I've seen in Scripture. Stay tuned. Good times ahead. So what are the before and after pictures at that second display? Before? Have faith in Christ. That's always the before picture. And what's the after here? Believe in Christ and then watch the plan of salvation unfold in your life. Watch hope come ultimate hope to be made a partaker of the heavenly gift which God has already wrapped up for you. In fact, it's not even wrapped. It's unwrapped, extended before us, there for the taking if we will simply have faith in Christ. Verse 10, the third display. Behold, it was by faith that they of old were called after the holy order of God. All those in the past who exercised God's divine authority, his sons and his daughters commissioned to perform work in his name. This would be a composite photograph of unnumbered multitudes there who have occupied their space in the Faith Hall of Fame because they believed and their faith in Christ was what enabled them to be called after that holy order. Believe first and then the callings come. Believe and then come opportunities to exercise the power and authority of God. Verse 11 suggests an interesting exhibit. Next in the display case is the law of Moses. And it's placed side by side with its successor, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see how they're side by side in 11? But they're both brought about by faith. By faith was the law of Moses given. But in the gift of his Son hath God prepared a more excellent way, and it is by faith that it hath been fulfilled. So both the law and the gospel, Moses and Christ, both of those came about by faith. Now typically we only associate faith with the gospel, not so much with the law of Moses, but think about it. What was God's ultimate goal? To bring us into the celestial promised land, not just the Canaanite version, but as we've seen repeatedly, 
to achieve a Zion location, you have to achieve a Zion lifestyle beforehand. And as the golden calf experience proved, they weren't ready for it. But God in his mercy at least gives them something, a step in the right direction, a stepping stool, a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ. I have faith in them that they can make it, that they can eventually, ultimately, live that level, that celestial law. In the meantime, though, let's give them a law of Moses that's at least higher than the telestial level of living they experienced in Egypt. Help them become terrestrial on the way to celestial. And you can sense faith on God's part, faith on Moses' part, faith on the Israelites' part, that we can do better than we've done. And faith in the law of Moses suggests faith in everything that that law, every wit, as Amulek says, that points towards the atonement of Jesus Christ. That is the more excellent way. And faith brought the first step, and faith fulfilled the second. This is faith in each step up the staircase, almost a faith to faith to parallel the grace to grace that we see in Doctrine and Covenants 93. So believe first, and then the steps appear. The line upon line, precept upon precept, you can do this. You can be better than you've been. Learn the commandments and begin to live them. Learn the gospel and begin to accept the change of nature that it provides. Every step along this excellent way is paved by faith. Verse 12, if there be no faith among the children of men, God can do no miracle among them. Wherefore, he showed not himself until after their faith showing his hand through the miracles that he performed. You will not see them until after your faith is proven. So believe first, and then let the miracles occur. He'll repeat the same idea in verse 16. Even all they who wrought miracles wrought them by faith, even those who were before Christ and also those who were after. Interesting that Moroni would distinguish the two. He's living as an A.D. saint, as he's writing mostly about B.C. saints. The book of Hebrews reflects the same divide. Old Testament B.C. saints occupying the corridors, but a New Testament A.D. saint acting as your tour guide. Seems to suggest, in my mind at least, that there are those who have faith before Jesus even came, and those who have faith afterwards. Now you'd think that, well, wouldn't it only be faith in the first instance? Those that come after Jesus have much more historical proof that he lived. But remember, proof and knowledge is a different thing than faith and assurance. So this is not historical hindsight saying, well, yes, Jesus must have lived. This is not some cognitive checking of the box to accept the fact that he existed. It's still relational. It's still moral and agency. It's all, am I choosing him? Am I trusting in him? Whether it's faith before he comes or faith after he comes, it's still faith. I think you and I who live as A.D. saints recognize this. It may be easier for us to accept empirical evidence that a Jesus of Nazareth existed. But do we have faith in him so that miracles can continue to flow from him into our lives, even for us A.D. saints? Now go back to verse 13 where we left off on the tour and the display cases become much more specific to the Book of Mormon now. Verse 13, Behold, it was the faith of Alma and Amulek that caused the prison to tumble to the earth. We see that clearly back in Alma 14 where Alma prays, O Lord, give us strength according to our faith which is in Christ, even unto deliverance. And they broke the cords with which they were bound. Later in that chapter, verse 28, Alma and Amulek came forth out of the prison, and they were not hurt. For the Lord had granted unto them power according to their faith which was in Christ. Can you get a sense there? As you're looking at this display, the the busts of Alma and Amulek there, frayed ropes where the cords were broken, A few broken stones rubble from the prison as it collapsed around them. If you look at the plaque next to the display, it even includes a much earlier verse of Scripture, the thesis statement of the Book of Mormon itself, from 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 20, where Nephi says that one of his purposes in writing is to show unto us latter-day readers that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen 
because of their faith to make them mighty even unto the power of deliverance. Doesn't that describe Alma and Amulek's escape perfectly? Tender mercies, power of deliverance. But what lies at the center of that scripture? Because of their faith, they chose Jesus and therefore were chosen by him to make them mighty unto the power of deliverance. First, believe. Then, go out from bondage. Be freed from the chains of addiction. Come out. Be free. It all begins with your faith in Christ. Come down the hallway. The next exhibit is another beautiful one. Verse 14, Behold, it was the faith of Nephi and Lehi, not son and father, brother and brother, that wrought the change upon the Lamanites, that they were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Remember in Helaman 5, when they are in prison, so similar to what we just saw with Alma and Amulek, and as all those in the prison are under this cloud of darkness, until Aminadab tells those in the darkness of the prison to repent and cry unto the voice, even until ye shall have faith in Christ. As soon as they did, they were encircled about by a pillar of fire. The Holy Spirit came down and entered their hearts, and the voice from heaven came, saying, Peace, peace be unto you, because of your faith in my well-beloved. So what do we learn from that exhibit? First, believe, and then receive the Spirit into your life. Be baptized by that cleansing fire. Find light that pierces the darkness and peace that reassures you. Even when in prison, the Spirit will come. It's the fourth part of the fourth article of faith. But where does it all start? With the first, with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, another famous display. Behold, it was the faith of Ammon and his brethren which wrought so great a miracle among the Lamanites. Can you see the faces of these four brothers there, this part of the Faith Hall of Fame? Perhaps we see Ammon's sling or his sword under glass as part of this display. Definitely not any of the arms that he cut off when using it. After all, there's no age restriction in this Hall of Fame. We want the children to be able to come through. But to see that it was their faith that did this, Faith in their own repentance and conversion. Faith in the possibility that the Lamanites could be converted as well. They went. They faced those fears because of their faith in Christ. Even when Ammon was teaching King Lamoni, listen to what he said. A portion of that spirit dwelleth in me, as he's talking about the great spirit, which giveth me knowledge and also power according to my faith. I'm here, King Lamoni, because of my faith. I had power to defend your flocks because of my faith. I know that you and your people can be changed and cleansed because of my faith in Jesus Christ. So for Ammon, for his brothers, for all of us who are trying to be missionaries like he was, first believe and then change people's lives. Rely upon that power of Christ to do the changing. I remember teaching an institute class one semester where we were really tackling all the tricky parts of church history. And I kept telling my students, if you have friends who are struggling in their faith, bring them to class. And one day, a couple of hours before class began that night, I got a text from a student, awesome, awesome young man. And he simply said in his text, I'm bringing a bunch of my inactive roommates. Tonight better be good. And I could just sense from him this, this okay, I'm going to do this. I'm bringing them. You said that we could, but they need to be fortified. They have difficult questions. And I just texted him back and said, don't worry. I'm not feeling any pressure here. What I'm feeling instead is faith, yours. Thank you for exercising faith in inviting them to come. Thank you for believing that changes could happen in their lives, in their understanding. First believe and then change people's lives. Missionaries do that every day. Now keep coming down the hallway. The last display had four figures, the sons of Mosiah. Now we see three. Verse 17, it was by faith that the three disciples obtained a promise, that they should not taste of death. And they obtained not the promise until after their faith. Honestly, there's no way of knowing that was going to happen until it did. As you see, the other nine all reach that 72nd birthday and you outlive them. 
your faith preceded that miracle. So in their case, or in a different way in our own, first believe and then conquer death. I will always be touched by the memories of the first Easter I spent with my wife as we testified to each other of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And admittedly, hers was so much more powerful than mine because hers was so much more personal than mine. My wife lost her mother to leukemia when she was eight and lost her brother to a car accident when she was 15. My wife understood and experienced death in ways that I never had. But as a result, she understood and experienced life like I didn't particularly the life promised through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These three Nephites could stare death in the face and know that Christ had overcome it for them. Well, in a different way, we can do the same. Death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is swallowed up in Christ. It has been for my wife. It can be for all of us. But we'll never obtain that promise. It might be offered us. It has been, but we won't accept it until after our faith allows us to. Keep reading. Verse 19. This is another composite exhibit. Hard to distinguish specific faces in the crowd. There were many whose faith was so exceedingly strong, even before Christ came, who could not be kept from within the veil but truly saw with their eyes the things which they had beheld with an eye of faith, and they were glad. Beautiful understatement there at the end. Think about that. They saw with the eyes of faith first, and then later they saw with physical eyes the things they'd already seen spiritually. I love how Elder Bednar describes spiritual and physical creation in terms of our daily prayers. That in the morning, when we give that morning prayer, we are spiritually creating the day. We get that sense from the book of Abraham's account of creation. That that version was the spiritual creation of the earth. The plan of God, as he lays out what this plan of salvation is going to entail. Leave it to Moses or Genesis for the plan to become actual work. The spiritual to become the physical. Again, morning prayer, spiritual creation of our day. And then throughout the day, what do we do? We begin to see with the physical eye what we saw that morning with our eye of faith in the prayer. We work hand in hand with God to make that happen, to bring physical out of the spiritual. And then what are our evening prayers? The chance for us to return and report on the creation that took place that day. And throughout our lives, day after day, spiritually creating in the morning and then physically creating throughout the day and then returning and reporting that night and then resting up so we can have another day's work tomorrow. Eventually, God will say of our creation, what he said of his, that it is very good. No wonder we can be glad with that. It's that level of faith that creates things. It's that level of faith that parts the veil. They could not be kept within it because they'd already seen with the eye of faith, what was on the other side. You see, he gives us the example of that, the ultimate one, in verse 20. Behold, we have seen in this record that one of these was the brother of Jared. So there is one face that stands out in this display in the Faith Hall of Fame. For so great was his faith in God that when God put forth his finger, he could not hide it from the sight of the brother of Jared because of the word which he had spoken unto him, which word he had obtained by faith. See the point he's trying to make? Had already seen the Lord's finger with the eye of faith. Remember, he said that earlier on, before the vision actually unfolded, before the veil parted. He said, God, just touch with thy finger these stones, and they will shine. He had enough faith that God could do that. But what he had seen spiritually, he then was able to see physically as the Lord parted the veil and reached out with that finger. He couldn't be kept from seeing it because he already had. The veil did him no good. It was no longer necessary. So easily parted when that's the case. We sometimes use the phrase these days about, oh, I can't unsee that. Well, again, with the eye of faith, which then leads to seeing with the eye of flesh, the things beyond the veil can't be unseen. 
I can't unsee the finger of God because I've already seen it in faith and now he sees it in fact, which then expands the vision. We're ready to take another step here. Verse 21, after the brother of Jared had beheld the finger of the Lord, the second time, the first was with faith, the second was in fact, because of the promise which the brother of Jared had obtained by faith, the Lord could not withhold anything from his sight. Wherefore, he showed him all things, for he could no longer be kept without the veil. He couldn't unsee anything. So what do we learn here? First picture, believe. Second picture, part the veil. See things as they really are. See them with the eye of faith so that eventually you will see them with the eye of fact. But your eyes will have been changed through that process. You will have an eye single to the glory of God. You'll have eyes so much more like the eyes of seers who can see things that otherwise could not be seen and make known things that otherwise could not be made known. Now in verse 22, we're reaching the end of the Faith Hall of Fame. We're near the exit here. One final display, he says, it is by faith that my fathers have obtained the promise that these things, he's referring to the Book of Mormon now, should come unto their brethren through the Gentiles. This is where it all comes together. His father's life work. The whole Hall of Fame has been leading up to this moment. All of these Book of Mormon prophets have had faith that someday their work would come forth. It would be worth it. It would make a difference for people eventually even if people refuse to allow it to make a difference during the lives of those prophets themselves. That's going to be especially important for someone like Moroni, who's not going to be able to see it happen in his day. But all those prophets, all those fathers of the faith, had the faith that these things would eventually come forth. They obtained a promise from God that that would be the case. And God could not withhold that promise because their faith was so strong that they required it of him. That's the word that was used in the book of Enos. Near the end of his prayer, the final concentric circle, the one that's more all-inclusive now, Enos says, knowing that the Lord God was able to preserve our records, I cried unto him continually, and I had faith. And I, Enos, knew it would be according to the covenant which he had made, wherefore my soul did rest. And then the Lord responds to him, Thy fathers have also required of me this thing. Powerful verb. To require something of God. That's not us pulling rank on him. We have no rank to pull. What requires anything of God? Faith does. True faith. That that's the Father's will as well. Faith that parts the veil. Faith that allows us to come boldly to the throne of grace. Faith that forces God's hand to emerge. It could not be withheld them. Thy fathers have required of me this thing, and it shall be done unto them according to their faith. For their faith, Enos, was like unto thine. Such an incredible stockpile of faith heaped up by generation after generation of Book of Mormon prophet. These words have to come forth, Father, for the salvation of a ruined world. And it's in that moment that all of a sudden the Faith Hall of Fame becomes incredibly personal to its tour guide. Moroni all of a sudden realizes that at the end of this hallway, right next to the exit sign, is one more little alcove with a display that's still blank. One last installation yet to be filled. And Moroni in this verse realizes it's his. See how he ends verse 22? It started all about the Father's promises that God will eventually make sure that these words come forth unto the Gentiles so that the Gentiles can eventually bring them to the remnant of their seed. And then the verse ends. Therefore the Lord hath commanded me, yea, even Jesus Christ. And right there, it's like Moroni's like, whoa, wait a minute. You get a sense of what he's saying? All our ancestors put all their eggs in the restorations basket. They just knew. They had faith. They saw with that eye of faith that someday the Book of Mormon would come forth. 
and they believed, they required it of the Lord. They obtained his promise. The Book of Mormon will eventually come forth. And that's why the Lord has commanded me. <gasps> ah, right there, it's like Moroni is like, oh my goodness, I'm in this. Their faith is riding on my works. If I don't do my job, if I don't fulfill my part in this plan, then can God keep his promises? Will this book ever come forth? Will the Father's prayers be answered according to the promises God has made? This is why the Lord has commanded me to perform this work, to finalize my Father's life's work, to bury these plates, and I'm sure yet unbeknownst to him, to play the pivotal role in connecting that day to Joseph Smith's making sure these words do eventually come forth. I love that Moroni sees himself here. It's the experience that each of us is supposed to have with this tour of the Faith Hall of Fame. We're supposed to see right before the exit that there is space for our exhibit as well. Will you and I ever be installed in that Hall of Fame? Will we believe first so that afterwards Miracles can take place in our lives and the lives of those that we serve. Therefore, the Lord hath commanded us to do things too. And all of that to do will come because of our to believe, our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, at this moment of recognition, of realization. He's staring into the glass of this empty display case and he sees not through the glass anymore but all of a sudden his reflection in the glass. And here Moroni has something of an identity crisis. He kind of freaks out here going, I don't belong in the Hall of Fame. I know all these stories. Trust me, I was raised on them. Every time I'd go into my dad's office he was always working on scripture. I may have lived at the tail end of my civilization with no flesh and blood backup, but I had a band of brothers from a thousand years of Nephite history, and I knew I could not hold a candle to them. Remember, it's Moroni that talks about imperfections more than anyone else I can detect in the Book of Mormon. In Mormon 8.12, whoso receiveth this record and shall not condemn it because of the imperfections which are in it. Mormon 8.17, if there be faults, they be the faults of a man. Mormon 9.31, condemn me not because of mine imperfection, neither my father because of his imperfection, neither them who have written before him, but rather give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest unto you our imperfections, that ye may learn to be more wise than we have been. Mormon 9.33, if we could have written in Hebrew, behold, ye would have had no imperfection in our record. And as he writes the final lines on the title page of the book before he buries it in the Hill Cumorah. And now if there are faults, they are the mistakes of men. All of those come from Moroni's pen. He is concerned about his own weakness. He is facing his own inadequacy here. I don't belong here. There's no way I can be part of the Faith Hall of Fame. Like I said, in verse 22, he realizes that their faith is writing on his works, and he does not want to be the weak link in the chain. You sense that in verse 23, where he says unto the Lord, he interrupts, it's just shocking to see the tour guide all of a sudden kind of drop the microphone he's been speaking into, and stare up into the heavens and say, Lord, I I can't do this. The Gentiles will mock at these things, because of our weakness in writing. And you know what? He was right. I read every newspaper article I could find between 1829 and 1844 throughout the United States, anyone that mentioned the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And you know what surprised me as the one most common theme throughout them all? It was mockery. They ridiculed the story of the Book of Mormon start to finish. Some farm boy finding a gold Bible in the hillside in New York, looking at it through stone spectacles and trying to interpret languages that nobody's heard of before. Are you kidding me? Even worse, because Joseph Smith himself was so uneducated, he was no grammarian, that when the language first came out of his lips, it came across pretty rough. The Lord said it would be that way, that he speaks to men according to their 
language, that they might come to an understanding. Well, Joseph's language was never very polished. Some Gentiles mocked the Book of Mormon on those grounds, saying, oh, well, if it was written in Reformed Egyptian, I hope the angel had a better grip on Egyptian than he did on English. Because old Joe Smith should have consulted more than just a gold Bible. He should have consulted a Webster's Dictionary. That, after all, was hot off the presses just two years before the Book of Mormon was. But they mocked, they ridiculed, they laughed it to scorn. It's interesting that even in the Doctrine and Covenants, when it was beginning to get to a point where the saints wanted copies of their own. And so this uh, conference assembles in 1831 and they decide, what are we going to do with these? They ask Heavenly Father, should we publish this as a book of revelations for the saints? And the Lord gives them a resounding yes. But even with that, the more educated among them were a little concerned about some of Joseph's phraseology as they saw it. The Lord calls them out for that in section 67. He says, your eyes have been upon my servant Joseph Smith Jr. And his language you have known and his imperfections you have known. And you've sought in your hearts knowledge that you might express beyond his language. This you also know. Talk about getting taken to task. There's the Lord calling him out. There seemed to be a level of embarrassment, even among some of them, over Joseph's weakness, his imperfection in language. Moroni understands that so perfectly. And Joseph Smith himself wrestled with it as well. A year after that experience with the Book of Commandments, the Doctrine and Covenants, I don't know if he's still smarting from that experience or still feeling inadequate in his own language, but he writes a letter to W.W. Phelps, who was a wordsmith extraordinaire an editor of the newspaper, a lyricist of many of our most powerful hymns, a poet, a writer. He was incredible with language. And Joseph himself was not. But he writes in this letter, O Lord God, deliver us in thy due time from the little narrow prison, almost as it were, total darkness of paper, pen, and ink, and a crooked, broken, scattered, and imperfect language. Get a sense that Joseph is just wrestling with, I can't do justice to the truths of God. Taking divinity down to humanity, something is always lost in translation. And Joseph is seeing his own weakness and his own battle against the crooked, narrow prison of English as one who was never an expert in the subject. It's interesting that right before that sentence in the letter, I had heard that before. And I always loved that statement. But as I looked at the letter itself, right before he said that, this is what he said to his friend William. O oh Lord, when will the time come when brother William thy servant and myself behold the day that we may stand together and gaze upon eternal wisdom engraven upon the heavens? You see where he wanted to see it? I don't want to see it written in words. I want to see it engraven upon the heavens. I'm a visionary not an English major, a prophet, not a penman. He went on, while the majesty of our God holdeth up the dark curtain until we may read the sound of eternity to the fullness and satisfaction of our immortal souls. Did you catch that? He wanted to read, but he wanted to read the sound of eternity. This is the same Joseph that near the end of his life said that what's written in the scripture are just hints of what existed in the prophet's mind. How do you convey those hints into someone else's understanding? How do you take consciousness to consciousness when it has to pass through communication on the way? That's why Joseph always seemed to just pray for spirit to spirit communication so that my words don't get in the way of things. I want you to have these experiences for yourself. Don't confine us both to this narrow prison of human language. If any of you served a foreign speaking mission, I'll bet you felt this keenly, especially at the beginning. My sister is a wordsmith along the lines of W.W. Phelps. She always knows just what to say, and she says it beautifully. She was an editor for a national magazine after college. She's just really, really good with words, and she got called on a mission. Spanish speaking. And she told me later it was one of the most humbling experiences of her life to find herself in Venezuela 
trying to convey an understanding of the gospel, which was incredible, through a language that in her mouth was still juvenile. She said, even when I became fluent, it was like, <sighs> I've been reduced to like a second grade vocabulary. I found myself doing the same thing once I realized that, because I was feeling pretty, pretty proud of myself. Like, man, I'm good at Spanish now that I've been serving for a while. Until I realized, wait, translate it back into English and hear what you're saying. It may be coming out smoothly. Sure, you're fluent, but you're still not very educated. You're no Cervantes. <laughs> this is first grader. This is, I feel good about these things. I like the Book of Mormon. The church is good. It was so childish. Actually, it was so childlike. The Lord more than made up for it. But do you get a sense of this? The Gentiles will mock at these things because of our weakness in writing. I cannot do justice to the things of God. He then says this, the end of 23 and into 24. It's amazing the phrase that keeps getting repeated. For Lord, thou hast made us mighty in word by faith. So faith is still the core even there. But thou hast not made us mighty in writing, for thou hast made all this people that they could speak much because of the Holy Ghost which thou hast given them. And thou hast made us that we could write but little because of the awkwardness of our hands. See the phrase that keeps coming up? Thou hast made, thou hast not made, thou hast made, thou hast made, thou hast not made. He's recognizing God's hand behind both what he has and what he doesn't have both his strengths and his weaknesses. And I think it's important for us to see God behind both. You've blessed me in this area of my life. You haven't blessed me in this other. And I need to accept your will in both cases. Perhaps credit myself a little less for the things I do well and blame myself a little less for the things that I do poorly. In terms of talents, okay, I'm not talking about temptation and sin. We'll see some of that a little bit later. But you gave this gift to that person and this gift to the other. It will be Moroni, by the way, in chapter 10 in a couple of weeks to discuss the spiritual gifts, some of which I'm sure he knew he had and others he knew that he didn't. But it's interesting the specifics here of what have you made us and what haven't you made us. When it comes to verbal communication, the blessing was there. When it came to written communication, he felt like it wasn't. There's been some fascinating research done on the difference between orality, the spoken, and literacy, the written, and the pros and cons, the strengths and weaknesses of each. Walter Ong is probably the scholar most famous for this, and he's written about the difference between speech and writing, between oral cultures and scribal cultures. And I loved what he described when it came to sound. I'm a book guy. I love to read. And I'm, I'm a visual learner. And so I've always loved books. I surround myself with them. And it gives me a chance to really pour over language and, and phrasing and words. You've probably gotten a sense of that through these videos. But as a teacher who relies upon speech, I've loved what I've learned from Professor Ong about the difference between these two forms of communication. The spoken versus the written is like spontaneous experience compared to ongoing intellectual study. When it's spoken word, you're in the moment. You're surrounded by that sound. It's it's happening as as you're going along. You can't go back because you're caught up in the next sentence. Whereas written, you can stop and pour over every word. You can draw parallels and connections and see difference over time. You get a sense of what's been said in the past and compare it to what's being said in the present. Spoken is more subjective and written seems to be more objective. There is participation versus distance, communion versus solitude, unity versus isolation, harmonization versus dissection, a living present in the spoken word versus a dead past in the written. The spoken word is like an ongoing conversation, whereas the written word is more like fixed and final thought. And we know which one Moroni preferred. Walter Ong compared it to pressing living flowers to death between the pages of printed books. And Moroni felt crushed by having to confine himself to print. When you're speaking, especially by the power of the Holy Ghost, you're in that moment. 
you're just caught up in the spirit of this. Have you ever had a conversation where it was like, oh, you had to be there? Or times where you were at a fireside or a general conference and it just, you were moved powerfully by the spirit. And then later you went and you reread the words and it was like, something's missing here. Now again, I love the written word, but there is power in the spoken. The great LDS historian Richard Bushman put it this way about these verses. Moroni spoke for every writer in every age, but most poignantly for the prophets who had to bridge the gulf between divine vision and human language. Again, taking heaven down to earth, something always seems to get lost in translation. At least it did for Moroni as he was feeling, especially as compared to what he'd just read from the brother of Jared. Remember what he said back in Ether 4, verse 4? That there never were greater things made manifest than those which were made manifest unto the brother of Jared. So the brother of Jared wrote about the most incredible subject matter, but he also seemed to have the most incredible spiritual gifts for being able to put that subject matter down on the page. The way that Moroni describes it here in chapter 12, middle of verse 24, Behold, thou hast not made us mighty in writing like unto the brother of Jared. For thou madest him that the things which he wrote were mighty even as thou art unto the overpowering of man to read them. If that verse doesn't make you excited for the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon, I don't know what would. You know how sometimes you look at the back of a book and it's got some words about, you know, high praise for this volume? It's like gripping, page turner. Well, on the back of the sealed portion, it would say, as mighty as God is overpowering of man to read them, Moroni. He's read them, he's sealed them, and he's blown away by them. And compared to that, I'm nothing. Compared to the sealed portion, the unsealed portion will seem laughable, at least in the Gentiles' eyes. That, by the way, also makes me more and more excited for the sealed portion. Because honestly, I'm blown away by the power of the language, the written language of the Book of Mormon. Spiritually speaking, I believe, I testify that it is scripture, the word of God. But even just intellectually, I consider it a literary masterpiece. It's incredible. I hope you've gotten a sense of that. But I do understand where Moroni is coming from. What I do as compared to what he can do, it pales in comparison. Verse 25, Moroni then returns to that wrestle between the written and the spoken. Thou hast also made our words powerful and great, even that we cannot write them. How do you reduce heaven to human language? It just can't be done. We cannot write them. Wherefore, when we write, we behold our weakness. We stumble because of the placing of our words. You sometimes get a sense of that when you see movies or things of of an author with writer's block and kind of head in their hands and they're pulling out their hair and they're surrounded by wadded up pieces of paper next to an overflowing trash can. I just can't put down on paper what's in my mind or in my heart. I get a sense here that if golden plates could have been crumpled up into a wad and thrown into the wastebasket, Moroni would have done it. I fear lest the Gentiles shall mock at our words. And remember, as Jesus taught and as Mormon taught and Moroni gets it, the Book of Mormon is going to have to pass through the Gentiles on the way back to the remnant of the house of Israel. And if they don't see it for what it is, if they can't recognize its spiritual worth, then this whole scriptural enterprise that the gathering of Israel is riding on, it's not going to happen. Now, do you understand why Moroni is having this faith crisis, this trial of his own faith at the end of his tour of the Faith Hall of Fame? I cannot be the weak link in the chain, and I'm not good enough to do justice to these words. Now, in verse 26, the Lord begins to reassure Moroni, and I love how he does it. Verse 26, he speaks unto him and says, first of all, fools mock, but they shall mourn. So he does acknowledge what Moroni was worried about. I fear the Gentiles will mock at these things. And like I said, historically, they did, and they still do. The great American humorist Mark Twain called the Book of Mormon chloroform in print. 
In fact, he may have had fun with the book of Ether, since Ether in his day was something along the lines of that kind of chloroform. Ether as a gas that could put you to sleep. Mark Twain was the one who joked and said, oh, if you took out all the end it came to passes, the Book of Mormon would just be a pamphlet. Gentiles began mocking the Book of Mormon even before it rolled off of E.B. Grandin's press. And we've had a more recent Tony Award-winning musical in Broadway that's been mocking things in horrific ways. There's no denying that's happened. And the Lord doesn't deny it. He simply says, oh yes, they'll mock. But it says more about them than about the thing that they are mocking. Fools mock, but they shall mourn. And then this all-important reassurance. My grace is sufficient for the meek, that they shall take no advantage of your weakness. I love that the Lord is saying that, that meekness makes up for weakness. The two are not synonymous, as the world might say. In fact, they're antithetical, that meekness makes up for weakness. It compensates for it. It protects against it. And I think he's speaking not only to Moroni, who needs to be meek in this situation and trust in the grace of God, but also all of us later readers of the Book of Mormon, that if we are meek and humble as we approach God's word, then it will be powerful to us, just as the Lord promises. So if you are meek, you won't worry about being mocked. Or if you are meek, you would never be the one to mock others. Either way, there's no advantage taken over weakness. It's as if the Lord is reassuring him there in 26. Moroni, the Book of Mormon's going to be fine. Don't lose any sleep over it. I got this thing. These are my words. In fact, that's how the Lord refers to them in section 10 of the Doctrine and Covenants. When he's talking about the loss of the 116 pages and what the Lord's enemies are trying to do with the word. And the Lord doesn't just call it the Book of Mormon. He keeps referring to it as my words. There's ownership there. There's a sense behind those possessive pronouns of, I got this thing. These are my words, and I'm going to make sure they don't fall flat when they emerge from the press. My grace is sufficient for the meek. And while it might seem that it's not sufficient for the prideful, well, they need to humble themselves if they're ever going to get benefit from this to begin with. You get a sense of this, at least the more positive approach, from Nephi. First Nephi in the Book of Mormon. It's almost like Moroni, this is where you need to get. Okay? He says at the end of his book, I know that the Lord God will consecrate my prayers for the gain of my people. And the words which I have written in weakness. You see, Moroni, I recognize that in myself too. But I know this because of my faith in Christ. The words which I have written in weakness will be made strong unto them. Even closer to the end of his writings, Nephi says this. And it's almost repeated in how Moroni ended things at the end of the Book of Mormon. And if they are not the words of Christ, Nephi says, judge ye. So I'll leave them in Christ's capable hands, and the Lord will take care of it. Christ will show unto you with power and great glory that they are his words. There's the possessive pronoun again. At the last day, and you and I shall stand face to face before his bar. Moroni said the same thing to us. And ye shall know that I have been commanded of him to write these things, and then catch the last phrase, notwithstanding my weakness. I'm human. I'm mortal. Of course, my fingerprints on the book might get in the way for some people to see the fingerprints of God, but they're all over the book too. When Joseph of Egypt gives us his prophecy of Joseph of Palmyra, he says, out of weakness he shall be made strong. And the same could be said of the book that he was called to translate. Of that book, that same Joseph of Egypt said this, and they shall cry from the dust, yea, even repentance unto their brethren, even after many generations have gone by them. And it shall come to pass that their cry shall go, even according to the simpleness of their words. Sometimes that kindergarten vocabulary of a meek missionary does more good and has more power than anything a university professor could say. Because of their faith, their words shall proceed forth out of my mouth unto their brethren who are the fruit of thy loins. And the weakness of their words, I admit it's there, will I make strong in their faith. That has to be there too. 
unto the remembering of my covenant, which I have made unto thy fathers. You see that thread run throughout the Book of Mormon? Weakness, fine, but strength as well. A strength that will be undetectable to the prideful, but so tangible to the meek. The Book of Mormon will be one of those things that helps sift out those two groups. The prideful versus the meek. The tares versus the wheat. Nephi admits it way back in 1 Nephi 6. This book won't mean much to those who care too much for the things of the world. But for those who care about the things of God, this book will be the ultimate blessing. The Book of Mormon thus becomes the barometer for our own spirituality. As President Benson used to say, it's not the book that's on trial. We are. So will we mock and mourn? Or will we be meek and recognize God's grace as the space that human weakness leaves is infused with the power of God? That's the power of what God is offering here for the Book of Mormon, for the efforts of these prophets and the efforts of you and me anytime we try to convey the truths of God to other people. If you'll forgive me for being a little personal here, but a little time before I began this YouTube channel, I was approached by some people at Deseret Book and asked if I would film a few little lessons to try to help reassure people that questions are welcome in the church. And because I feel so strongly about that, I agreed to do it. That was the first time I'd ever been filmed doing anything, really, at least for, for outside consumption. And I felt like I was a train wreck. Honestly, afterwards, I, I texted those that were in charge of the project and said, hey, I'm sorry, if you aren't able to find enough usable footage and just need to scrap the whole thing, I promise it won't hurt my feelings. I'm so sorry that I was the weak link in the chain. I totally felt the way Moroni felt here. People are going to mock at my weakness. God has made me mighty in teaching, I felt, and all glory to him. But that verbal, that spoken communication, that in-the-moment experience in a classroom, it's powerful. And I felt like it was completely missing when it was just me and a camera and a few people behind it. I joked with them and said, I'm so sorry that when my brain and a camera are in the same room, only one of them is on at a time. And yet, know what they kept saying to me? Every time, reassurance, reassurance, reassurance. Oh, you'll be amazed at what happens in the editing room. Post-production, the miracles take place. And I thought, well, good luck turning that sow's ear into a silk purse. I can only imagine what actors in Hollywood must feel when they've got green screen behind them and they're just on a soundstage somewhere and they're acting as well as they can but thinking, if all people saw was this, with no CGI, with no soundtrack, if you've ever seen like a director's cut or a making of kind of a thing, and you're like, wow, how did this ever become a blockbuster? Well, it's as if God is the director here, reassuring Moroni. You'll be amazed at what happens in post-production. When the same spirit you feel when you are speaking my words will come through the page like a voice from the dust. Maybe that's why the Book of Mormon keeps referring to itself like that. That in a way, it still will be spoken unto us. We'll be in the moment, surrounded by the sound of these past prophets, hearing King Benjamin from his tower, listening to the Lord at Bountiful, letting Moroni speak to us the way he always wanted. Removing the Holy Ghost from our scripture study is like pulling away the CGI and turning off the soundtrack in a movie. It's being in a stale and sterile soundstage. But when the Spirit comes, it breathes life into these words. And the meek who are open to that Spirit take no advantage of what might be considered elsewhere as weakness. Now, all of that leads up to verse 27, which I hope you've been anticipating. It's one of the great passages in all of Scripture. You're probably well familiar with it. But do you see it in context now? In the middle of Moroni's identity crisis, his worry over his own inadequacy, verse 27, the Lord says to him and to any of us who feel inadequate because of our own weakness, 
if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. Now take both of those phrases one by one. Let's start with the second one. I will show unto them their weakness show us as if it were invisible to us before. It wasn't to Moroni, but sometimes it is to us. And one of the things the Lord wants to do is show us our weakness. Doctrine and Covenant 66, he says, Repent of those things which are not pleasing in my sight, saith the Lord, for the Lord will show them unto you. Look a little closer. There are yet cracks in your character, and the Lord wants to bring them out into the open, visible, so we can begin working on them together. In the book of Job, he asks God for that clearer sight. He says, that which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. I just don't, I can't see my flaws. I don't know where I need to work. That wasn't pride saying they didn't exist. That was meekness saying, help me see them. And the Lord does, but notice when he does it. If men come unto me. And that's an if, not a when. If you'll come, then I'll show you your weakness. Our weaknesses appear in relation to our proximity to Jesus. And the closer we come to him, the larger loom before us what used to be very small or insignificant sins. You see, from a distance, when I was very far away, that thing that was right up next to him seemed very minor. Surely he'll excuse me of those little things. But if the Lord cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance, well, the closer I come to him, the larger those things loom. I remember years ago teaching seminary, and the first time I was going to teach the Book of Mormon, I wanted my classroom to be kind of an immersive experience for my students. I wanted them to be living Lehi's dream. And so I reproduced it upon the wall. The tree of life was Jesus, almost a life-size printout of him that I laminated and put on the wall with an iron rod that led to him, which was the word of God. It was a scripture printed out like 20 feet long. And that iron rod, the word of God, literally brought them to the tree, the love of God, which is Jesus. I put a great and spacious building there, but I wanted the mists of darkness to be a little bit more interactive as well. So I brainstormed as many sins as I could possibly think of. And I printed them out on these little cards and laminated all of those and stuck them all over that wall. And I kind of had some fun with it where I put the most grievous sins the furthest away from Jesus. And more minor ones were a little bit closer to him. And I actually caught my students off, and it was always fun to watch them before class started or after it ended, and they'd just be scanning that wall and trying to see sins that they hadn't noticed before. And the most enterprising among them would even change their, their relative order sometimes. They're like, what? This thing's not as bad as that thing, and they'd switch them. Like eating fruit out of season. I don't even know if that's a sin, but if it is, it's really close to Jesus, I assume. Whereas others, more obvious, more grave sins, were the ones that were farthest away. But it was interesting about this was recognizing what is, what's the sin that keeps me from Jesus? Well, right now it's my largest one. It is halting my progression from him. And here I am standing behind this biggest sin. That's why it's often been said, what's the most important commandment? Whichever one you're not living right now. Whichever one is halting your progress back to God. Well, as soon as I repent of that, what can I do? I can progress forward in my journey until I bump up against the next biggest sin. And then I repent of that and then can continue progressing until I bump up against the next biggest sin and so on and so on. Well, again, from this distance, I can't even see the path ahead. It's all, my view is blocked by this sin that I'm grappling with. But if I were to eliminate all of those and see the sins, the, the tiny mistakes that are closest to him, like I said, they wouldn't even bother me from here. But as I come unto him, I mean, you could take a three by five card and from 100 yards away, you don't even notice it. But get up right next to the 3 by 5 card, and it could literally block your entire view. And so, if I come unto him, and as I come unto him, I will see my weakness. Often it's a recognition of our more small errors and sins that don't mark how bad we are, but in many ways mark how good we are, because we finally notice those things. Did you sense that happen to you, perhaps, on your mission? 
and you came home and you were just different and you were calling your parents to repentance for things that you didn't, well, that didn't phase you at all beforehand. You're like, how could you watch that movie? And they're like, oh, it was your favorite movie like two years ago. We didn't even like it. We just thought, welcome home. I thought you'd like to see it again. But no, I'm not who I used to be. I'm closer to Jesus than I was two years ago. I'm more bothered now by things that back then weren't even on my radar. Isaiah was probably a really good guy. But if you read Isaiah 6, it's when he's brought into God's presence in this vision that he realizes, I am a man of unclean lips. How could I possibly speak for thee? Simon Peter was the same character right before and right after this miraculous catch of fish. But before it happened, it didn't seem to faze him that Jesus was on his boat. He just needs a place to stand so he can address the people on the shore. But once he recognizes who Jesus is, once he has come unto the Christ, what does he say? Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. No more sinful than he was a couple of minutes before, but he's seeing his sinfulness in ways he hadn't recognized earlier. He was coming unto Christ. What's Moses say after his encounter with God? Now I see that man is nothing, which thing I never had supposed. I didn't even see my weakness until I had spent time with strength personified. This, by the way, is the most powerful way to recognize our reliance upon Christ. I have had students over the years sometimes worry that, well, the people who really seem to love Jesus are the ones who have sinned the most and realized how much they need him. They recognize the distance between them and God. And as a result, they want to bridge that distance. Whereas sometimes the good kids that have never sinned grievously don't really recognize their reliance on the Lord. They love him as their teacher or their example, their guide, but don't really love him as their savior because they haven't realized that they've needed saving. And do you see the danger of that? Because some might think, oh, then I probably ought to sin, so I'll love him more. No, just keep coming into Christ and you'll realize just how far away from him you are in terms of his perfection and our imperfection. We don't have to dig a pit to recognize our distance from God. Just come as close as you can to the pedestal. And once you get there, you will look up and see how much infinitely above you the Savior is. You will feel weak next to that towering pedestal upon which the Savior stands. It makes it all the more humbling that he would reach down to us and want to lift us to his level. The Lord then teaches Moroni this beautiful principle I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. Moroni, you kept talking about I've made them this and I made them this. I made you mighty here, but didn't make you mighty here. Well, I give. Do you see that weakness is a gift from God? And it's a gift that is meant to help us become humble, which is one of God's ultimate goals. Remember, it's the meek that don't take advantage of others' weakness. And notice also that it's weakness singular. Later in this verse, we'll see weakness plural, or as he says, weak things. But weakness in the singular is simply our human nature, our fallenness, our humanity, which, if recognized, will teach us of our need for God. I don't know if Joseph Smith even recognized how spot on he was when he described himself in Joseph Smith history with both the plural and the singular form of this idea. When he's talking about his imperfect adolescence, he says this, I frequently fell into many foolish errors, there's plural, and displayed the weakness of youth, singular, and the foibles of human nature. There we're back to the plural. But then he goes on to say, I often felt condemned for my weakness, singular, and imperfections, plural. Is there a difference between weakness and weaknesses? I think so. I remember early on in our marriage, my wife was lamenting her own weaknesses, her lack of perfection. I just remember reassuring her and saying, honey, I do see weakness in you, but I have a hard time noticing any weaknesses 
that have come as a result. You're human, like we all are. We can't do everything on our own as well as we would want. But that is just human weakness, and that's not going to change. The worry is when our weakness starts spinning off weaknesses in which we indulge. When our weakness spawns imperfections that we don't want to repent of. But it's our weakness that will never go away. Even as we repent of those weaknesses, it's our weakness, our distance from God, our humanity, that helps us recognize how much we need Him. And it's only that that's going to help us repent of and change the weaknesses that have come as a result. The Lord speaks often and mercifully of weakness in the singular. Doctrine and Covenants 38, 14. I will be merciful unto your weakness, singular. Even when he can't look upon our sins with any degree of allowance, he can still be merciful because he recognizes our weakness. That's what condescension in Christ's case came down to. Christ felt he put upon himself human weakness. He just never gave in to any human weaknesses. Sense the difference? Later in the Doctrine and Covenants, 62 verse 1, he introduces himself as Jesus Christ, your advocate, who knoweth the weakness of man. And as a result, he knows how to succor them who are tempted to give in to weaknesses. In Jacob 4, verse 7, it's about as close to what Moroni teaches us here as you can get. Jacob says, The Lord God showeth us our weakness, that we may know that it is by his grace and his great condescensions unto the children of men that we have power to do these things. I love that. Weakness as a gift to introduce us to the need for grace. No wonder he shows us our weakness as we come unto him. It keeps us coming. It keeps us coming unto him for more. For more weaknesses to recognize and more grace to rely on. Nephi got it, clearly. He says in 1 Nephi 19.6, And now if I do err, even did they err of old, not that I would excuse myself because of other men, but because of the weakness, singular, which is in me, according to the flesh, I would excuse myself. I do just have to acknowledge my humanity. That's not to say my depravity. There's a difference here. We don't believe in original sin, but we do believe in original weakness. And I think that it's important that we acknowledge our weakness, even as we continue to work upon our imperfections. In both cases, what's the solution? The Lord's grace. My grace is sufficient. It's enough. It's more than enough to compensate for your weakness. Between the two of us, I promise we will always be strong. It's only on your own that you're left with your weakness. My grace is sufficient for all men. But here's the caveat there. All men that humble themselves before me. His grace is not sufficient for the prideful because they'll never accept it. But if they humble themselves before me, and have faith in me. Now we're back to the subject of Ether chapter 12. Faith in me. You can't see it yet. You can't see his strength. You can't see your own. You can only see your weakness. But if you see that and humble yourself as a result and come unto me and have faith in me, then what will happen? Then will I make weak things, there's the plural, become strong unto them. The weakness itself won't change, but the weak things that have come as a result will be changed into strengths. It's amazing what Christ's sufficient grace can do in those circumstances. Paul understood this perfectly. And in a conversation that he had with God in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, notice both parts. My grace is sufficient for thee, the Lord says. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's your humanity that gives space for my divinity. It's your weakness that allows room for my strength to come in. And so how does Paul respond to that? Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The context of that verse, by the way, is in the middle of that unanswered prayer 
where he keeps pleading with the Lord to remove this thorn from my flesh. Help me be better than I am. Help me overcome my human weakness. And that's when the Lord says, no, 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 no. Don't you see weakness is a gift? It's turned you to me. And as long as it keeps turning you to me, then I will turn weak things into strengths. I never want you to outgrow me or get to a point where you don't rely upon our relationship. So allow that weakness to stay and simply start working on your weaknesses, those imperfections. I will make you strong. But on your own, you'll never change a weak thing into something strong. You simply don't have the strength to do it. Don't you remember that list we saw in the Faith Hall of Fame from Hebrews chapter 11? That long list of things that happen to people who exercise faith in Christ? One of the most applicable to this part of the conversation, this segment of the tour, out of weakness were made strong. It's exactly what is happening here for Moroni. By the way, I won't take the time to do it here because I've already done it elsewhere. But the idea of turning weak things into strengths is such a profound principle, especially when you tie it in with its companion principle that Elder Dallin H. Oaks taught years ago, that your strength can become your downfall. You see how it could go in both ways? Weak things can be made strong, but your strength can become your downfall, which suggests, to my mind at least, that there is a, an inherent relationship between strengths and weaknesses. Not just a matter of, oh, I'm strong in these things and I'm weak at these things. It's like, no, this specific attribute both has a strong manifestation and a weak manifestation. I call them coins that have a head, there's the positive, and a tail, that's the negative. Now, I taught this principle back in the video for Alma chapter 38, because I don't think I've ever seen a better place to teach it than in Alma's conversation with his oft-forgotten son, Shablon. That chapter only has 15 verses, but I've never seen a better example of a place to teach the idea of attributes as coins with heads and tails, and those coins having complementary coins with their own heads and tails that help keep both sides heads up. That's the idea of proving contraries. Contraries are simply complementary coins that stay heads up and keep either coin from flipping to their tails. If that's confusing to you, or if it's just intriguing to you, then please go back and rewatch the video for Alma chapter 38. It's called Strengths and Weaknesses, and it describes this principle as well as I could. But back to Ether 12, move forward to verse 28, and you'll see the Lord finish his reassurance to Moroni. Behold, I will show unto the Gentiles their weakness, if they're looking for weaknesses, oh, there's plenty for them to see. It won't be in the Book of Mormon. It'll be in themselves. At least if they're meek, they'll recognize that. And remember, Jesus is very gifted at helping people see their own weaknesses instead of the weaknesses of others. Just ask those who brought the woman taken in adultery and cast her at Jesus' feet. They were condemned by their own conscience and no stones were thrown. Meek Gentiles if they turn to God, will not see the weakness of the Book of Mormon. They will see the weakness inherent in themselves. And then what will the Lord show them? I will show unto them that faith, hope, and charity bringeth unto me the fountain of all righteousness. That's my goal for them, those Gentiles. It's my goal for you, remnant of the house of Israel. Now by verse 29, the Lord's reassurance worked. I, Moroni, having heard these words, was comforted. And I said, O Lord, thy righteous will be done, for I know that thou workest unto the children of men according to their faith. I love Moroni's recognition there. I may not have faith in my own works, but I do have faith in my faith. You're right, Father. In my own weakness, the own awkwardness of my hands, I know I can't do it, but it's not my hands that I should be focused on. I'm in thy hands, and there's no awkwardness there at all. I know that you work according to our faith, and I have faith in thee, even when I don't have faith in myself. And again, we shouldn't have faith in ourselves independent of God. 
We should have faith in ourselves as a result of the grace that is sufficient to make us into something stronger than we would ever otherwise be. When I am weak, then am I strong, Paul says. Moroni is getting that too. He draws upon the examples that he's already seen in his own tour of the Hall of Fame. Verse 30, the brother of Jared said to the Mount Zaran, remove, and it was removed. If he had not had faith, it wouldn't have moved. But it worked after men had faith. And I have to exercise my faith too. The Book of Mormon will then take care of itself. Moroni is passing his own trial of faith as we speak. Verse 31, he mentions those disciples again. The Lord didn't manifest himself unto them until after they had faith. Once they'd obtained and exercised that faith, they spoke in the Lord's name. The Lord showed himself unto them in great power, more power than they could ever muster on their own. Verse 32, Moroni goes on, I also remember that thou hast said that thou hast prepared a house for man, yea, even among the mansions of thy father, in which man might have a more excellent hope. Remember, that's the hope that Ether talked about earlier on in this chapter. Hope for a better world. Hope at the right hand of God. That ultimate hope is exactly what Moroni is talking about here. Wherefore, man must hope, or he cannot receive an inheritance in the place which thou hast prepared. Moroni puts that concept in ultimate terms in 33. Again, I remember that thou hast said that thou hast loved the world, even unto the laying down of thy life for the world, that thou mightest take it again to prepare a place for the children of men. If I can have ultimate hope in that for me, why can't I have proximate hope in the power of the Book of Mormon as it comes forth? I have nothing to worry about. And again, here is where faith, which has turned into hope for Moroni, finally turns into charity for him as well. Just like we saw in verse 4 from Ether. Verse 34, Now I know that this love which thou hast had for the children of men is charity. Wherefore, except men shall have charity, they cannot inherit that place which thou hast prepared in the mansions of thy father. See how faith and hope and charity are mutually reinforcing? Almost this spiral upward, heavenward. Again, hold on for Moroni chapter 7, the greatest chapter on faith, hope, and charity in the standard works. He then returns to the thought of the Gentiles in 35. Wherefore, I know by this thing which thou hast said, that if the Gentiles have not charity, earlier he was worried about them not having meekness to the point of mocking these things. Well, now he's worried again, what about their charity? If the Gentiles have not charity because of our weakness, that thou wilt prove them and take away their talent, yea, even that which they have received and given to them who shall have more abundantly. In other words, if they won't have charity for your weakness, I'll force them to develop some charity for their own because they'll recognize their own weakness and have to grapple with it somehow. You see the process? Our recognition of weakness leads to humility. Humility leads to faith in Christ's grace. Faith then leads to hope, and hope leads to charity, and charity to patience for the weakness of others. And the cycle continues. Moroni is praying that that cycle will happen for the Gentiles. That's why in verse 36, I prayed unto the Lord that he would give unto the Gentiles grace, that they might have charity. Such a beautiful prayer. By the way, it was that same prayer that Joseph and Hiram offered to the Lord on their way to Carthage before leaving Nauvoo for Carthage. That last long ride. Hiram opened to Ether chapter 12, these verses, and read them and turned down the page upon them. He too was praying that the Gentiles he was about to face might have grace in hopes that they might have charity. If they could simply recognize their own weakness, their own reliance upon the Lord, wouldn't they see in us humble servants that are trying to rely upon the Lord too, notwithstanding our weakness? Please give them grace, Father. Please let them have charity for us. But then verse 37, the Lord responds to Moroni and to Joseph and Hiram, If they have not charity, it mattereth not unto thee. Thou hast been faithful, wherefore thy garments shall be made clean. And because thou hast seen thy weakness, thou shalt be made strong, even unto the sitting down in the place which I have prepared 
in the mansions of my Father. What a beautiful reassurance. The Lord's been giving Moroni a lot of those in this chapter. But to him, to Joseph and Hiram, to you and me, regardless of other people's reactions, they may still mock at your weakness. So be it. Please be faithful. Rely on my grace. It is sufficient for anyone who will come unto me. So don't worry about those who don't. Just make sure that you do. It's the only way that your garments will be free of blood. You don't have to worry about the garments of others. Verse 38, by the way, is Moroni bidding us farewell. But that verse as well was one that Hiram was quoting that morning. When John Taylor wrote what we could consider a eulogy for the prophet and the patriarch, Doctrine and Covenants 135, he mentions this verse as well with the previous two. So picture not just Moroni saying this to us, picture Joseph and Hiram saying it to us as well. And now I, Moroni, and Joseph, and Hiram, bid farewell unto the Gentiles, both those who mock and those who are meek, yea, and also unto my brethren, whom I love, until we shall meet before the judgment seat of Christ, where all men shall know that my garments are not spotted with your blood. Moroni did his work. Joseph and Hiram did theirs. And through them, the Lord did his work, which he made strong in spite of their weakness. Moroni then finishes this chapter. Then shall ye know that I have seen Jesus. I came unto him. How else do you think I saw my own weaknesses so clearly? And that he hath talked with me face to face. And that he told me, I love this phrase, in plain humility. How can we not be meek with the Lord of meekness himself? How can we not be humble when he who knows all things can speak unto us in plain humility? No wonder he understands our weakness. He's willing to condescend to it. No wonder he speaks unto man according to their language, after their own weakness, so that we can understand. The Lord himself speaks in plain humility, even as a man telleth another in our own language concerning these things. And then in 40, Moroni says, and only a few have I written because of my weakness in writing. It's like, Moroni, we just talked about this. You don't have to keep excusing yourself because of your weakness. I know you couldn't write at all. It's okay. What you've written is sufficient, especially since my grace is. Moroni, I don't want to hear the word weakness come out of your mouth anymore. Okay? Trust me. I, we can do this together. And with that reassurance, he says to each of us in verse 41, And now I would commend you to seek this Jesus of whom the prophets and apostles have written, from Lehi all the way down to Moroni, from the brother of Jared to Ether himself. They have taught and testified of this Jesus. So seek him. Why? So that the grace of God the Father and also the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost, the entire Godhead, offering you their collective grace. If you'll come, if you'll seek him, grace isn't just in the finding, it's in the searching. It's not just found at the destination, it's found all along the way. If we will seek this Jesus, then that divine grace, which bears record of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it will be and it will abide in us forever. Amen. What a testament from Moroni. This is his second of three attempts to finish his message to us. Mormon chapter 9 was his first attempt. Moroni chapter 10 will be his third. He still needs to get back to abridging Ether's history, and he will in 13, 14, and 15. But here, as he closes off chapter 12, is his second try. And how does he do it? By pointing us to Jesus. Here, he seems to be echoing the way that his old world counterpart concluded his tour of the Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. Specifically at the Sarah exhibit, it says that she had faith in these impossible promises because she judged him faithful who had promised. 
It wasn't faith alone. It was faith in him she judged faithful. It was faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Moroni is commending us to seek him. May I conclude this tour of the Hall of Fame from the New World with what was said right after you exit the one in the old. Hebrews 11 is followed by Hebrews 12, which starts with this beautiful phrase. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That's what halls of fame are. A chance for you to be encompassed about with a cloud of witnesses. People that did all that was needed to make it to Canton, to get to Cooperstown, to be inducted into a hall of fame. And honestly, if you ever go through that and just see all these displays, it makes you want to be a better athlete or a better musician. It just, oh, there's your dreams. I want to be here someday. And whether you are encompassed about by the biblical cloud or the Book of Mormon cloud we just spent time with in Ether chapter 12, what's the result that's supposed to come from it? Once you see yourself amidst that cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's his statue that we see once we've exited the Hall of Fame realizing that everything that we saw before on this tour was pointing to him. He is the author. He started it. He is the finisher. He will end it. He is the source and the substance of our faith. And if it is by faith that we are justified, that's only because our faith in Christ is always justified. So enjoy the tour. Look to Abraham and Sarah. Look to Moses and Rahab. In the Book of Mormon, look to Alma and Amulek. Look to Nephi and Lehi. But more than anything, look to Christ. Come unto him. No matter how worried we might be over our own weakness, it was a gift to point you back to him. And his grace is sufficient if only we will come. Studying Ether 12 through 15 this week, is a lot like our experience studying 4th Nephi, which begins with this crescendo in Christ to a time of perfect peace, a mini millennium, but then descends towards destruction by the end. And the same happens this week in Ether. Ether 12, which we studied in the first part of this lesson, is such a masterpiece. I hope you felt that as we studied it together. But it is followed with the destruction of the Jaredite civilization in 13, 14, and 15. And it comes crashing down quickly, right before Ether's eyes. Now Moroni knows he has to come off the mountaintop and get back down into the valley of the shadow of death. He says in 13, 1, Now I, Moroni, proceed to finish my record concerning the destruction of the people of whom I have been writing. You see, Ether 12 was just a long interruption. A beautiful one. I'm so glad he interrupted the narrative so he could give us that incredible explanation of faith since that's what Ether had been talking about. But do you remember where chapter 12 began? That Ether, who spent his life during the days of Coriantumr, and Coriantumr was king over all the land, and Ether was a prophet of the Lord. So you have a king on one side and a prophet on the other. In fact, there may be more connections between these two than just the time period. Back in chapter 11, verse 17, we don't have a name here, but there's been this reign of kings. And remember how we saw last time, the middle of Ether is so much about secret combinations and intrigue in search of power and gain. And so they're constantly fighting one another over the kingdom. And that's exactly what happens at the end of chapter 11. But in chapter 11, verse 17, there arose another mighty man. We don't get his name here. We simply realize that he's a descendant of the brother of Jared. And he overthrows the king and obtains the kingdom. And it's that line of ex-kings that then spends the rest of their days in captivity. From the king that is overthrown, Moran, to his son, Coriantor, to his son, Ether. Which lets you know something about Ether. If the kingdom hadn't been usurped by this unnamed mighty man, then K 
King Morin, grandpa, the kingdom would have passed down to his son, Coriantor, and his grandson, Ether. It would have been King Ether. Instead, it is King Coriantumr, which makes me wonder, is Coriantumr in the line of that mighty man who usurped the throne? Was the unnamed individual in 1117 Coriantumr's father or grandfather? Are we seeing two rival lines of potential kingship here, which might help explain why Coriantumr would not want to accept Ether's call to repent at all? even when Ether doesn't seem to be after a mortal throne at all, only a divine one. However it happened, by 12 verse 2, Ether the prophet comes forth in the days of Coriantumr and prophesies unto the people. Now in the first part of this, we saw that his prophecy was not just repentance like his predecessors, but rather faith unto repentance. But notice a few more details about him that will help introduce the rest of what he's going to write in 13, 14, and 15. Ether 12, verse 2, he began to prophesy unto the people, for he could not be restrained because of the Spirit of the Lord which was in him. I love that he couldn't be stopped, couldn't be held back, couldn't be restrained because the Spirit was so strong. Sure, wicked kings and secret combinations can place a restraining order on the Word of God, but because of God's Spirit, it cannot be restrained. Preacher's going to preach. Prophet's going to prophesy. And it's the Spirit that is compelling this. There's a great passage in Jeremiah that fits this description really well. Remember, Jeremiah was a contemporary with Lehi. And he was probably a little jealous that Lehi got to leave. Because if Lehi was going to be killed for crying repentance in Jerusalem, well, you get a sense of what Jeremiah is going to face there. And sure enough, his book is full of persecution. At one point he says, I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. Well, fools mock, but they shall mourn, we've seen. But they were mocking Jeremiah to the point that he was done. He's ready to take off the missionary tag, hang up the suit and tie, and be done with the whole thing. He says in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, God, nor speak any more in his name. I'm not going to do it. I'm in derision daily. I'm being mocked constantly. I'm being persecuted and opposed. So I'm finished. But the irony there? He couldn't even last an entire verse because the verse begins with him saying, nope, I'm done. And the verse ends with this. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. I love Jeremiah for that. Of recognizing what he was up against and being daunted by it but not giving up on things, not even lasting a single verse in his desire to just throw in the towel. I couldn't. I tried. I wanted to. But his word was in my heart like fire in the bones. People talk about, oh, it's so tiring to share the gospel. No, in his case, it was more tiring to stop sharing the gospel. Missionaries would say, it's so hard to open my mouth. Jeremiah would look at you going, what? Isn't it harder to keep it closed? I could not stay. I had to go and share the message. And that's Ether to a T. He couldn't be restrained because of the Spirit of the Lord which was in him. Verse 3, he cried from the morning even until the going down of the sun with that message that we discussed last week. Believe in God unto repentance. But to do it from sun up to sun down. You remember the word that the Lord used with Nephi, son of Helaman, in Helaman chapter 10? Right before giving him the sealing power, he said, because you have served me with such unweariness. That's sun up to sun down kind of discipleship. The way Ammon describes it after his mission, behold, the field was ripe and blessed are ye, my brothers, my fellow companions, for ye did thrust in the sickle and did reap with your might, yea, all the day long did ye labor and behold the number of your sheaves. Or the Lord of the vineyard in Jacob 5. What could I have done more in my vineyard? Have I slackened mine hand that I have not nourished it? Nay, I have stretched forth mine hand almost all the day long, and the end draweth nigh. Now you might think, well, he didn't do it all the day long. He only did it almost all the day long. He must have taken some breaks in the meantime. No, he only said almost because the day wasn't over yet. The sun hadn't gone down. The end draweth nigh, he says at the end of that verse. 
Oh, I'm planning on working all day, all the day long. I'm just not there yet. I'm not finished with my work. One chapter later, when the work is over, Jacob 6, he says, How merciful is our God unto us, for he remembereth the house of Israel, both roots and branches, and he stretches forth his hands unto them all the day long. Ether here is following a good example, that of the Lord himself, that never takes time off from bringing people homeward. Now we already saw, his initial message is faith unto repentance, lest we be destroyed. But then when you get to chapter 13, and Moroni picks up with that message, notice the people's response to it. Verse 2, behold, they rejected all the words of Ether. Now, as we saw last time, part of the reason for this rejection is that they couldn't see with the eye of, of flesh what they were supposed to see first with the eye of faith. But what else did Ether's message entail? He truly told them of all things from the beginning of man. And that after the waters had receded from off the face of this land, it became a choice land above all other lands, a chosen land of the Lord. Wherefore the Lord would have that all men should serve him who dwell upon the face thereof. See why they wouldn't like that message? He's talking about the promised land, which requires that we keep the promises of God. Whereas he calls it here a choice land above all others, which requires that we choose the God of this land, who is Jesus Christ. In verse 3, he taught them that this would be the place of the new Jerusalem, which should come down out of heaven, the holy sanctuary of the Lord. But if we want to bring heaven down to earth, we're going to need to bring earth up towards heaven. We have to connect the two by the way we live our lives, by the way we follow Christ. And Ether's audience was unwilling to do so. In verse 4, he saw the days of Christ. He spake concerning a new Jerusalem upon this land. Just like Moroni, Ether is putting his eggs in the restorations basket. The last days, this will finally come. But we can prepare for those days. Verse 5, he spake concerning the house of Israel and the Jerusalem from whence Lehi should come. You remember earlier prophets had gotten more and more specific about oh, it's going to be destruction. And then a little bit more, it's going to be utter destruction. Then a little bit later, it's going to be utter destruction to the point that another civilization will come and occupy this land. Well, here it's most specific of all. That new group that will come to possess the land will be the house of Israel. And they'll be leaving behind the land of the old Jerusalem to come to the land of the new Jerusalem. That Jerusalem from whence Lehi should come, it would be destroyed, it would be built up again, a holy city unto the Lord. But because it was rebuilt, it would be a renewed Jerusalem, but not the new Jerusalem. It could not be a new Jerusalem, for it had been in a time of old. But it should be built up again and become a holy city of the Lord, and it should be built unto the house of Israel. That's old world. That's old Jerusalem. But in verse 6, a new Jerusalem would be built up upon this land in the new world unto the remnant of the seed of Joseph, for which things there has been a type. In other words, we should have seen this coming. This has been foreshadowed. He explains that in verse 7. For as Joseph, son of Jacob, brought his father down into the land of Egypt, and we could say, and the rest of the family as well. Even so, he died there in a new land, the land of Egypt, new for them. And in a similar way, the Lord brought a remnant of the seed of Joseph out of the land of Jerusalem, old Jerusalem, that he might be merciful unto the seed of Joseph, that they should perish not, even as he was merciful unto the father of Joseph, that he should perish not. So you see the typology there? Joseph brought his family into Egypt to preserve their lives. And again, a remnant of the seed of Joseph, namely Lehi and his family, would also come to a new place to be able to preserve the entire family of Israel, spiritually speaking. In verse 8, he goes on, The remnant of the house of Joseph shall be built upon this land. It shall be a land of their inheritance. And they shall build up a holy city unto the Lord, the new Jerusalem here, like unto the Jerusalem of old, there. And they shall no more be confounded until the end come when the earth shall pass away. And there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, and they shall be like unto the old, save the old have passed away and all things have become new. And then cometh the new Jerusalem. Now this is where it gets a little tricky. 
up to this point, he's been comparing old and new Jerusalem kind of horizontally. One's old world, one's new world. Now he's going to shift and talk about a new Jerusalem as compared to an older Jerusalem vertically. A Zion from above compared to a Zion from below, if we can put it in those terms. So in verse 10, when he says, then cometh the new Jerusalem, otherwise we'd scratch our heads going, wait, 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 we've already talked about building a new Jerusalem. And that's the point. Up to this point, it's been a new Jerusalem that is being built. Now we're talking about a new Jerusalem that is being brought. But it can't get brought until it's been built. I hope this is making sense. The new Jerusalem that will come is going to come to meet a new Jerusalem that has been constructed. So build or brought, come or construct. There's work to be done on our end in order to prepare the earth for the coming of Christ and the coming of Zion from above. You see here in verse 10, the new Jerusalem becomes this metaphor for Zion, the people of God, the city of Enoch, we could even say. And in verse 10, it's described as, blessed are they who dwell therein, for it is they whose garments are white, not because they were flawless and sinless, but rather white through the blood of the lamb. Only through Jesus and his atonement are we cleansed. They are they who are numbered among the remnant of the seed of Joseph, who are of the house of Israel. And you see that group, that heavenly new Jerusalem, then verse 11 meets an older group. Then also cometh the Jerusalem of old and the inhabitants thereof. Blessed are they, for they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. See the similarities between new Jerusalem in 10 and old Jerusalem in 11? We've all been cleansed by Christ. They are they who were scattered and gathered in from the four quarters of the earth, from the north countries. They're partakers of the fulfilling of the covenant which God made with their father Abraham. And when these things come, bringeth to pass the scripture which saith, There are they who were first who shall be last, and there are they who are last who shall be first. See what Ether is trying to explain here? There's an old Jerusalem in the old world. That would be the site of the scattering. There will be a new Jerusalem in the new world. That will be the site of the gathering. But there's also the righteous and redeemed in Christ who went before, and the righteous and redeemed in Christ who will come after. There are those who are building the new Jerusalem upon the earth in order to prepare it for the return of a new Jerusalem from above. Zion from below, preparing for the coming of Zion from above. We always talk about the rainbow in terms of the sign given to Noah, that God would not flood the earth again with water. But if you look at the Joseph Smith translation of those verses, the rainbow was actually a reminder of a previous covenant made to Enoch. And the covenant was, and this is such a perfect visual for the rainbow, that just as Zion was caught up to heaven, so shall it someday return. Isn't that what rainbows do? They either come up to heaven and return to earth, or if it's just half a rainbow, they connect heaven and earth together. And that's what Zion is supposed to do. It's not just a promise to Noah, I won't flood the earth. It's a promise to Enoch, I'll bring you back when the earth becomes the celestial kingdom. But for that Zion to be brought, another Zion must first be built. And that's where we roll up our sleeves and start building, start gathering. Think about the end of Doctrine and Covenants section 65, where the Lord says, call upon the Lord. In other words, Joseph, early saints, call on me, pray for this, that his kingdom may go forth upon the earth that the inhabitants thereof may receive it and be prepared for the days to come in the which the Son of Man shall come down in heaven clothed in the brightness of his glory to meet the kingdom of God which is set up on the earth. See what the Lord is asking the saints to pray for and work towards? We want the kingdom to go forth on the earth so the Lord can bring his kingdom to the earth. You see these two side by side again when Joseph responds to that petition by offering exactly that prayer. So the next verse, wherefore, or in consequence of what you just asked me to do, I'll do it immediately. Wherefore, may the kingdom of God go forth. That's the one we build. That the kingdom of heaven may come. That's the one that is brought. That thou, O God, mayest be glorified in heaven. 
sight of that Jerusalem, so on earth sight of this Jerusalem, that thine enemies may be subdued, for thine is the honor, power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. That is the prayer of the saints. That is the prayer of Enoch. That is the prayer of Ether here, and hopefully the prayer of each one of us. May the kingdom of God go forth, that the kingdom of heaven may come. Build and bring. Construct so it may come. New Jerusalem, old Jerusalem, either one, washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, verse 13, Moroni was about to write more. He wanted to. Sounds a lot like his father who wanted to keep writing too and was sometimes forbidden. Here, Moroni is forbidden. But great and marvelous were the prophecies of Ether. And if that little glimpse we just got in the last few verses is a part of that, wow, I wish I knew more. Talk about the destiny of the new Jerusalem to be built upon the American continent. There is work to be done here. But his immediate audience esteemed him as not and cast him out. And he hid himself in the cavity of a rock by day. And by night he went forth viewing the things which should come upon the people. Again, nobody understands this lifestyle better than Moroni who's stuck doing similar things. And here's where Ether's prophecy turns into Ether's history instead. And it all revolves around that rival, Coriantumr. Now again, assuming that this is part of that line of, of mighty men who usurped the throne. Remember the one detail we saw about that original mighty man who did that in Ether 11 verse 17? He was a direct descendant of the brother of Jared. So if that line's continuing to Coriantumr, then we would assume that Coriantumr is of the brother of Jared's line too. Something there just seems to suggest to me almost a chance to begin again. You could have done that, Coriantumr. You could have started things over. The way Mosiah starts things over for Lehi. The way Noah started things over for Adam. Remember, Ether's prophecy was about a new heaven and a new earth. Coriantumr. This is your chance to begin anew yourself. You're a descendant of the brother of Jared. Be like him. Call upon the name of the Lord. Repent of your sins. Bring your people to a land of promise. But what happens is exactly the opposite. I'm going to do a lot of summarizing in these last three chapters. And in a way, Ether already summarizes them as he starts to explain them in verse 15, 16, 17. In 15, he talks about a great war among the people and talks about secret plans of wickedness. This group is out to destroy Coriantumr and usurp the kingdom, which seems to be the name of the game throughout Jaredite history. But in verse 16, Coriantumr had studied himself in all the arts of war and all the cunning of the world. Wherefore, he gave battle unto them who sought to destroy him. What a tragedy that all of his study went to war instead of peace that he studied cunning instead of covenant, which then explains verse 17, that he repented not, neither his fair sons nor daughters, neither the fair sons and daughters of Kohor, and I have no idea who that is, neither the fair sons and daughters of Korahor, and we don't have any idea who that is, and in fine, there were none of the fair sons and daughters upon the face of the whole earth who repented of their sins. So I guess it doesn't matter so much who Kohor and Korahor are at this time period. Across the board, everyone with the exception of Ether refuses to repent. That was the case in those previous chapters whenever a prophet would come and cry repentance also. That describes Jaredite history almost start to finish. War, secret plans, wickedness, refusing to repent, and fair sons and daughters. Remember, Jared's daughter was described as exceedingly fair. The first group that rebelled and left reassured themselves that more would be coming because their people were such fair sons and daughters. It even makes me think of Mormon's final lament over his people. O ye fair ones, so blessed and yet so cursed by what you did to yourselves. Verse 18 mentions secret combinations, fighting one another in order to obtain the kingdom. Remember, get power and to get gain. Verse 19, they fought much, they bled much. And then 20 and 21, we see these two lines come together. Ether meets Coriantumr. 
In verse 20, the Lord says to him, Go and prophesy unto Coriantumr, that if he would repent and all his household, the Lord would give unto him his kingdom and spare the people. Obviously, Ether himself isn't worried or wanting the kingdom for himself. Verse 21, Otherwise, they, the people of Coriantumr, should be destroyed, and all his household, save it were himself. You will be the only survivor. And the only reason that you'll survive is so that you can live to see the fulfilling of the prophecies which have been spoken concerning another people receiving the land for their inheritance. Coriantumr would receive a burial by them, and every soul should be destroyed, save it were Coriantumr. Coriantumr, you can either be the last man to stand or the first man to kneel. Repent of your sins. Come unto Christ. Change things. Start over again. Be a new brother of Jared. Bring about a new heaven, a new earth right here. Make this a promised land by keeping God's promises. Make it a choice land by choosing God. It's completely up to you. But, verse 22, a phrase we should come to expect. It came to pass that Coriantumr repented not. Neither his household, neither the people. So the wars didn't cease, and instead they sought to kill Ether as well. He flees and hides again in the cavity of the rock. Now from this moment forward, chapter 13, verse 23, until the end of the book of Ether, this is the story of Coriantumr in a nutshell. Coriantumr loses and then regains the kingdom. He loses some battles and wins others. He's wounded, but survives. He loses the kingdom again, is wounded again, keeps trying to either regain or retain the kingdom, is wounded yet again, this time with such deep wounds that he faints from blood loss, tries to repent, but his people refuse, keeps on fighting, is wounded again, and again faints again from blood loss, until eventually his life results in exactly the way that Ether had prophesied it would, here in the middle of chapter 13. That is the story of the rest of the book of Ether. And you can read it verse by verse on your own. But let me point out just a few details in the intervening verses that I think have some special relevance for you and me. Just a few phrases here and there. Chapter 13, verse 25, for example, speaks of war upon all the face of the land, every man with his band fighting for that which he desired. Sound like our day? And this doesn't have to be literal war. But do you see everyone with his band, this idea of tribalism as groups form around certain desires, and they're fighting everyone else that desires something different, every man with his band fighting for that which he desired? In verse 26, not only are there robbers, that suggests Gadianton-style secret combinations, but all manner of wickedness upon all the face of the land. Again, describe our day. All manner of wickedness. I mean, people are being sinful in creative ways these days. Things I never would have imagined possible. But it's all manner, and it's upon all the face. At the end of verse 31, this phrase, I think, is again applicable. There was none to restrain them. So interesting that when we first meet Ether, he couldn't be restrained because of the Spirit of God that was in him. Well, here, the people couldn't be restrained from their wickedness because of the Spirit of the devil that was in them. This is going to be a head-to-head fight to the finish between good and evil. And among the wicked, no one was holding them back. Have we gotten to a point, or are we aiming towards a point, where there are no reins on society's wishes? When evil is progressing unrestrained, no one standing up to it, no one trying to turn it back. Chapter 14, verse 1, speaks of a great curse upon all the land because of the iniquity of the people. And it's the same curse that Samuel the Lamanite prophesied of among the Nephites and which Mormon saw in fulfillment. Again, end of civilizations, this is what it starts to look like. If a man should lay his tool or his sword upon his shelf or upon the place whither he would keep it, behold, upon the morrow he could not find it, so great was the curse upon the land. That's the talk of things becoming slippery that things just fall through your fingers. You can't hold on to anything that matters to you. And yet, in an attempt to do so, verse 2, everyone cleaves unto that which was his own with his hands. He wouldn't borrow, neither would he lend. Every man keeps the hilt of his sword in his right hand in the defense of his property and his life and his wives and children. 
Compare that to what Jesus taught when he descended among the people at Bountiful. To give to those that ask you, and even to those that would ask to borrow something, turn them not away. Be generous. Trust them that they need it. Trust that they'll return it to you again. Here, no one can be trusted. No one is trustworthy. And since everyone is just looking after number one, trying to meet their own needs, seeking their own power, getting their own gain, no wonder everyone stays armed and at the ready at every moment. Everyone I see is a potential enemy, someone trying to take something from me. So I'm armed to the hilt, sword in hand at all times. Have we gotten to that point? Or are we getting to it? Or we can't trust anyone? We're always worried about what people are going to try to take from us, and here I am to defend it to the death. Verse 8 speaks of secret combinations. Verse 10 speaks of secret combinations again. We studied that in depth last week. By verse 18, you meet one of our final antagonists standing alongside Coriantumr. His name is Shiz. And in verse 18, there went a fear of Shiz throughout all the land. Yea, a cry went forth throughout the land. Who can stand before the army of Shiz? Behold, he sweepeth the earth before him. And we sometimes feel that way when it comes to the wickedness that is spreading across the earth. Do we start to worry? Who can stand before it? Do we even try to? Or do we leave it to go run roughshod, to go unrestrained? By verse 19, you only have these two options now. Wicked A or wicked B. Wicked Shiz or wicked Coriantumr. Just like we saw at the end of Mormon's day. Wicked Nephites or wicked Lamanites. Take your pick, but either way, this is going to be a war of mutual annihilation. Verse 19, the people began to flock together in armies throughout all the face of the land, and they were divided. Some to the army of Shiz, some to the army of Coriantumr. Verse 21, so great and lasting had been the war, so long had been the scene of bloodshed and carnage, that the whole face of the land was covered with the bodies of the dead. War was still spreading so fast, they couldn't even bury them. You get a sense for how fast this is all happening? Honestly, it reminds me of 2020, that I can't even, I'm not even done dealing with last week's problem before this week's problem emerges. That, you get a sense from here, we haven't even been able to bury yesterday's casualties before more get piled up from today. We cannot keep up with the casualties, the conflicts, the contention. The issues keep piling up. And in this case, more literally, the dead bodies do. Unburied, verse 23, is pretty disgusting. But metaphorically, it describes our day pretty well. The scent thereof went forth upon the face of the land, even upon all the face of the land. Wherefore the people became troubled by day and by night because of the scent thereof. There does seem to be a certain stench of sin. And it is troubling when there seems to be no escape from it. In those kinds of circumstances, I would want to be as close as I could be to the altar of incense, the one thing that is bringing a sweet smell heavenward, there inside the temple, before the veil, to enter the presence of God. That is the scent of sacrifice, of righteousness, of consecration, rather than the stench of sin brought about by these secret combinations. In verse 25, thus we see, here's one of Moroni's, that the Lord did visit them in the fullness of his wrath. Compare that to the way the Lord visited, was it Emer last week? The son of righteousness comes and ministers to that righteous Jaredite king. Well, here the Lord is visiting them in a different guise, as wrath, as destruction. Their wickedness and abominations had prepared a way for their everlasting destruction. Remember, it is by the wicked that the wicked are destroyed. Mormon taught us that. Now, the battles continue between these two until you get to verse 30 at the end. One of those instances where Coriantumr is wounded and lost so much blood that he faints. But this phrase is new. He's been wounded before. He's fainted before. But this time he was carried away as though he were dead. And I get a sense there that this is the end until it isn't. In other words, this is a dress rehearsal for death and judgment for you, Coriantumr. Is this really where you want things to end? You get a sense of what it's like to lose your life and yet 
to come back to your senses and decide, is that really how I want things to be over? Or will I repent? Will I change? Do I want something different on take two? Now, this time it actually worked to a degree. Chapter 15, verse 1, when Coriantumr had recovered of his wounds, he began to remember the words which Ether had spoken unto him. He woke up to Ether's prophecy because it almost didn't come true. Remember, the prophecy was, you'll outlive everyone. You'll see everyone's death but your own. Well, he got a chance to just see his own death, in a manner of speaking, to experience it in a way. And he realized, I don't want that fulfilled. I want it to go a different way. In verse 2, he'd seen so many casualties, millions among his people, that he began to sorrow in his heart. And as a result of that sorrow, this is different than the kind of sorrow that Mormon saw among his tens of thousands of casualties. Remember, in his day, they were sorrowing, but he knew it was the sorrowing of the damned, not the godly sorrow he hoped for. Well, here, Coriantumr's sorrow is of the better sort. Verse 3, he began to repent of the evil which he had done. It took that much destruction. I sometimes wonder about that. If we keep ignoring opportunities to repent and the kind of cataclysmic calls to repentance that we're getting, what's it going to take before we finally are brought to our knees? Coriantumr began to repent of the evil which he had done. He began to remember the words which had been spoken by the mouth of all the prophets, and he saw them that they were fulfilled thus far. Every wit his soul mourned and refused to be comforted. Better than just feeling this sorrow and repenting of his sins inwardly, he started to take an outward action. In verse 4, he writes an epistle to his enemy, Shiz, and simply desires peace. If you'll spare my people, I'll give you the kingdom that you want. I see now, finally, that there's something more important than simply getting power and gain. Unfortunately, where it says that he began to repent and began to remember the words of the prophets, he should have begun that a long time before. Because even though it didn't seem too late for him to change, it had gotten to the point where it was too late for Shiz or for Coriantumr's own people to change. In verse 5, Shiz refuses the offer. I'll take the kingdom, that's fine, but I want to take your life along with it. And by 6, I don't even think that would have worked because the people wouldn't repent of their iniquity. They're stirred up to anger against the people of Shiz. Perhaps there was some kind of loyalty towards Coriantumr to the point that they didn't even care about the promise of preservation if it cost Coriantumr his life. It's like, no, we're going to fight to the death. They're stirred up to anger against the people of Shiz and the battles continue. So again, it's interesting that Coriantumr could not change his people. He couldn't even save them from themselves. And the war continues. By verse 11, the wars have moved them towards a place of finality, the hill Rama, which was the same hill where Moroni says his father, Mormon, did hide up the records unto the Lord, which were sacred. Here things are coming full circle. The same place where the Nephite civilization came to an end is where the Jaredite civilization came to an end. And it's what emerges from that place, the Book of Mormon, that is meant to keep us, Act 3, from coming to its own destruction as well. In a way, therefore, for both the Jaredites and the Nephites, the Book of Mormon becomes their last words. It is their grave marker, in a way. And that epitaph upon these two civilizational headstones says to repent and come unto Christ. Avoid the fate that we brought upon ourselves. Be wiser than we have been. May the strike one against Jaredite civilization and the strike two against Nephite civilization never become a strike three against modern civilization. Learn the lesson of Cumorah. Learn the lesson that the book that emerges from it is trying to teach. Verse 13, Ether watches all of this unfold. 14, for four years, they're gathering all the people, every single one. They were trying to get every last ounce of strength to one side or the other. Verse 15, everyone gathered to one army or the other. This is a universal polarization. 
It involves both men and women and children. There is no escaping the choice that you and I must make between good and evil. And if we don't make the choice of good, will it someday come to the point where the only choices we have are against rival evils? When wickedness goes unrestrained, that's the eventual outcome. In 16, you see howling and lamentation. In 17, more howlings, more mournings. Verse 19, the scariest of all. Behold, the Spirit of the Lord had ceased striving with them. Even the Holy Ghost laid down his arms. We've seen that with Mormons people as well. Someone's going to give up the fight first. Either us or the Spirit will yield to the desires of the other. And if we keep fighting God, eventually he stops fighting back. He surrenders if we don't. By that time, the verse continues, Satan had full power over the hearts of the people. They were given up unto the hardness of their hearts, the blindness of their minds, that they might be destroyed. They had given up on God. They had given up themselves to hardness and blindness. They couldn't feel the Spirit. They couldn't see the future that lay before them. In 20, they fight all that day and sleep on their swords. 21, they do it again. 22, they are drunken with anger. Oh, when iniquity becomes so intoxicating, when in this addiction towards sin to the point that you know you are destroying yourself, but there's no way to avoid it. By verse 26, the battle keeps whittling down both armies until there are hardly any left, but they still can't see the writing on the wall. Mutually assured destruction is what it's called in our day. And the acronym of that is telling. This is madness, and yet they are not avoiding it. Verse 26, they ate, they slept, and they prepared for death on the morrow. Compare that to earlier promises of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Well, they're going to eat and drink. They're going to sleep one last time because tomorrow we will die. And what's missing? No merriment here. Joy and iniquity was always a facade and mirage to begin with. Wickedness never was happiness, and they're finally getting to see that. In 27, they fight for three hours and faint for the loss of blood. Still not done, verse 28. The fighting continues until by the time verse 29 ends, all have fallen by the sword, save it were Coriantumr and Shiz. And Shiz had fainted with the loss of blood. Now, verse 30 and 31 are a little disgusting, so brace yourself. It came to pass that when Coriantumr had leaned upon his sword, that he rested a little, he smote off the head of Shiz. And it came to pass that after he had smitten off the head of Shiz, that Shiz raised up on his hands and fell, and after that he had struggled for breath, he died. Now that is disgusting, but I think it teaches a powerful lesson. Even after being decapitated, Shiz's body keeps struggling for life. I don't know of a better visual aid for what we might call unrighteous reflexes. Elder Maxwell talked about righteous reflexes, where we've yielded to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and become a new person, a saint through the atonement of Christ. But an unrighteous reflex, this is truly brainless wickedness because the brain is gone. It's disconnected from the rest of the body. And yet the body itself is still just trying to do something, to go on, to continue fighting. And are we guilty of that sometimes? Where we want to keep fighting even when we know we've been defeated. That seems to be Lucifer's approach. Still struggling for breath even when he knows his fight is futile. In 32, Coriantumr falls to the earth and yet again becomes as if he had no life. This is a second chance for a new beginning, another dress rehearsal of death and judgment that he's just passed through. When he finally does come to himself again, he has some choices to make. He can no longer spare his people. But will he have an opportunity to affect any other people? And he does. Remember, as had been prophesied, and we saw the history of it way back in the book of Omni, that Coriantumr outlives his own civilization long enough to overlap 
with the Mulekite civilization. He stays with them for nine months before he dies, which I think is fitting since that's the gestation period of a new life. And as he is coming to the end of his and, and carves his life story and the story of his people into this stone that King Mosiah would eventually translate, as if he were trying to give birth to a civilization that might be wiser than his was. As is recorded in the book of Omni, what he had carved on that stone was about his first parents who came out from the tower at the time the Lord confounded the language of the people. And the severity of the Lord fell upon them, notice this, according to his judgments which are just. And their bones lay scattered in the land northward. You understand what Coriantumr came to understand? That the entire destruction of his people he saw as just deserts for the wickedness of those people. We got what was coming to us. That's what all the wicked will say when they are punished. Jacob says it that way in 2 Nephi chapter 9. We will be constrained to acknowledge to God, thy judgments are just. My transgressions are mine. I never handed them over to you. I never repented of them. And not just this stone that Coriantumr engraved, but the bones that are scattered across the North Country as testament that we must repent because God's judgments are just when they could have been merciful had we pled for that mercy. The book of Ether then ends, verse 33. The Lord spake unto Ether and said unto him, Go forth. And he went forth and beheld that the words of the Lord had all been fulfilled, not that he'd ever doubted them. He finished his record, and a hundredth part I have not written. And he hid them in a manner that the people of Limhi did find them. The Mulekites would find Coriantumr and his engraved stone. The Nephites, specifically the people of Limhi, would find the record of Ether. The stone would be translated by Mosiah I. The 24 plates of Ether would be translated by Mosiah II. And thus the Nephites receive two witnesses from a dead civilization, speaking to a yet living one to be wiser than they were. Fast forward to our day and the cycle has repeated. We now have two witnesses, the Jaredite civilization and the Nephite, both pleading to us to be wiser than they have been. And as if both of those civilizations were speaking to us, the book of Ether ends with words from Ether that Moroni himself could easily echo. Again, these are parallel prophets. The last words which are written by Ether are these. And try to hear Ether and Moroni both speaking them in unison. Whether the Lord will that I be translated or that I suffer the will of the Lord in the flesh, it mattereth not, if it so be that I am saved in the kingdom of God. Amen. What happens to me in this life doesn't matter at all compared to what happens to me in the next. Father, thy will be done. I have been doing thy will, and I have come to trust it completely. As this same ether had said in that previous beautiful chapter, chapter 12, you can almost hear him saying for himself at life's end, whoso believeth in God might with surety hope for a better world, that was the only world that he had yet to look for. Yea, even a place at the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith, maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God. That verse describes the mission and the mentality of Ether beautifully. It does the same for Moroni. May it be the same for us. May we with surety hope for a better world. And that hope will only come as we exercise our faith in Christ.